This is an old report, but recently, after watching the Better Bigfoot programs on TV, it dawned on me that what we had experienced was a Bigfoot. Every September, my husband and I would go hiking to see the color. This trip was in September of 1970 to Pikes Peak State Park, located on the highest bluff on the Mississippi River in Iowa. September is a time when the kids are back in school. There was only one other car in the parking lot, so the trails were deserted. Pikes Peak had several walking trails, and we had decided to take the longest, which led to the overlook on the Mississippi. We had hiked almost to the point of the overlook. Fall had us crunching on the fallen leaves when we heard a large thump, thump, thump from behind the trees, followed by a loud animal scream that we had never experienced before. Having hiked in the woods almost weekly, we learned to identify most of the animal sounds around us. This was not an identifiable animal. The screech scared us so badly that we immediately turned around and ran as fast as we could all the way back to the ranger station. Having reached the ranger station, we immediately inquired about the animal we had just encountered. We explained in great detail what had happened, but the rangers said that they had no clue what it had encountered and that nothing similar had ever been reported. To this day, I am still haunted by the sound of the footsteps and the screech. Until the Bigfoot programs, I had never considered that what we had encountered could be a Bigfoot. Now, I'm 90% sure of my identification. A few years ago, when a couple of friends and mine were on a buddy's boat swimming around the San Juan Islands outside of Seattle, at least I believe that's what it's called, please if anybody's hearing this correct me because I am not native to Seattle, we saw what we thought was some sort of large water serpent, at least that's what it looked like. It was a clear summer day and we were cruising around on his boat, having a good time when my friend exclaims and points off to his left, what's that in the water? And we all look to see, and we can see this serpent-like creature swimming quickly, zigzagging through the water momentarily, raising its head and going back under. My one friend suggested that it was a sea serpent, but I don't know. Sea serpents don't get that big, and this thing was pretty long. If I had to guess, it was probably around 20 plus feet long and the thickness of a small tree. It was a little ways off in the water, but it looked slimy and scaly and had a dark blue and gray hue to it. I don't recall seeing any eyes, but it had a very serpent-like head. We weren't really terrified as much as we all were amazed at what we had seen, and that was the topic for the rest of the cruise. That's when my other friends mentioned that it could be the Ogopogo creature that supposedly lives in this area and the water, but I don't know. Not being a native to Seattle and this area, it was quite a surprise for me since I live down in California and I know we have our own fair share of lake and sea creatures, but this was on a whole different level to physically see it. I have never seen something before in the flesh that I could not explain. So cool, but so scary. At night, while in the process of going to sleep or waking up from sleep, I have experienced, experience and will presumably continue to experience the phenomenon known as sleep paralysis, paired with appearances from what I've come to know as shadow people. This is not a fictionalized creepypasta, nor any kind of bait and switch, me and my buddy saw this thing in the woods type of writing. I certify that everything in this writing is true in the sense that I have personally experienced it. This is not intended to be in any way funny. I am dead serious. I think that reading this may be disturbing for some, so please note that this is a warning. Let me start by noting that I am in no way superstitious and have a strictly scientific worldview. I don't believe in any kind of supernatural, ghosts, gods, angels, demons, the paranormal, or cryptozoology, or anything that would lead me to a supernatural explanation for these things. My current dominant hypothesis is that my brain, being the incredibly complex machine that it is, 
functions somewhat poorly during the shutdown wake-up cycles and creates these things for me to experience, and that they are only hallucinations. When I speak of the shadow people as they, or him, or her, what I really mean is the human-shaped hallucination that my brain created for me. Also, I am not sure if this is related or not, but I occasionally experience absent seizures. When this happens, I begin to feel extremely lightheaded, then overheated and nauseated, and then I see stars near the edges of my vision. Then the stars close in and fill my vision. I collapse. I become non-lucid and non-responsive, and I can only hear the environment around me in distorted frequencies. This usually only goes on for a few minutes, though it is hard to tell me while I'm like this. It happens about two to three times per year and can be triggered by perceived mental stressors. This started when I hit puberty and is still ongoing. In the most plain of terms, something about my brain is messed up and has serious malfunctions at times. I am aware of it though. You might think me less sane after reading this though. The occurrences of sleep paralysis and shadow people, hallucinations, started when I was in my early 20s and I was in college, probably around 2007. I was living in an apartment with a roommate, and when I wasn't getting dead drunk, I would routinely stay up for extended periods, 30 plus hours or more, to get my class assignments done on time. The repeat alcohol ingestion and sleep deprivation, in hindsight, represent risk factors that I now believe trigger these. Based on my own experiences, other risk factors for me include use of any kind of stimulants or depressants, or psychotropic drugs, high stress levels, and emotional and psychological instability. On one typical evening, I was in the process of waking up from a midday nap in the apartment. I had abused caffeine and sugar to push myself to finish a class assignment overnight, and naturally needed to catch up on lost sleep. I had fallen asleep on my bed in my street clothes. It was the kind of sleep that one gets after staying up for way too long. The best kind. I was lying on my back and beginning to drift towards consciousness, but wasn't fully awake yet. An in-between state. In this half-dreaming, half-awake state, I suddenly began to experience two very new things. A feeling of intense icy fear, and the feeling of a presence being in the room with me with malicious intent. As I looked toward the end of my bed, I saw a shadowy figure standing silently at the opposite side of the room. Judging from its form, it appeared to be a young adult male. The strangest thing about the figure was that it had no discernible features. Instead of just being an icy black silhouette with poorly defined edges, almost like more of a shadow than a physical object in and of itself, the figure then moved toward the foot of my bed, stopped, and simply stared at me, all the while projecting an extremely threatening presence through its body language. As this was happening, I felt that I needed to move to a sitting position and to tell this person to get the hell out of my room and leave my apartment. But strangely, found that I could not. I couldn't move, speak or do anything except move my eyes to follow the movement of the figure and was forced to lay completely still in a state of intense paralyzing fear. The situation became extremely personally invasive and upsetting as the figure had moved slowly from the end of my bed to a position directly beside me, standing over me, well inside of my personal space. I was still unable to do anything about it but breathe heavily and sweat. In that moment, I wanted absolutely nothing but for the figure to go away and leave me alone. I jolted awake in an instant, gasping for air convinced that there was somebody in the room with me. So I took out my pocket knife, I always have one in my pocket in my street clothes, waved it around in the near darkness and screamed at the perceived intruder to tell them to get out of my room and stumbled to the light switch. After turning on the lights, there was no sign of the mysterious figure. I repeatedly searched the small apartment for any sign of entry or disturbance. I found no sign of my roommate and no sign of any intruder either. Being a skeptic, I also immediately began questioning the reality of the experience and my perceptions. Had it been a nightmare? I hadn't felt like a nightmare, yet I obviously hadn't been fully awake either. It had felt more like a mixed reality, as though between waking and dream states. 
Clearly, this was something new and different. Waking up from this experience and mentally processing this was disorientating and upsetting, to say the least. I went to the bathroom, splashed some cold water on my face, and talked aloud to myself to mentally reinforce what I was doing, and fully regained my orientation and sense of reality. Later, after my roommate got home, I asked him why the hell he had been in my room while I was trying to sleep, and why he had just stood over my bed like that. I told him that he had seriously scared the hell out of me, and asked him not to do anything like that ever again. He said he didn't know what I was talking about, and that he wasn't home at the time. I said that I must have had a real serious nightmare, and went on about my business for the day. At this point, I thought that I might be going insane. I had never seen anything in my life that would not easily be explained by my existing scientific worldview, but simultaneously could not explain the bizarre and upsetting experience that I had just had. In my mind, I very quickly searched for any and all existing references to anything that could explain what I had just seen, no matter how ridiculous, and assembled a number of competing hypotheses. Hallucination, nightmare, mental malfunction, someone drugged me, someone broke into the apartment while I was asleep, ghosts, demons, alien abduction, interdimensional beings, out-of-body experiences, and the list went on from there. I did a Google search, which actually turned up a wealth of information. In relative terms, as the internet as a whole was not as well developed in 2007 as it is today, from those who had similar experiences, I found references to callers on Coast to Coast AM reporting seeing shadow men while in transitionary sleeping to waking states, and the appearances being paired with the feelings of intense fear and inability to move. The phenomenon is called sleep paralysis and is very well documented. Though the initial experiences were severely disquieting, and I cannot emphasize this enough, I felt better having a reasonable explanation for it. In my opinion, what makes this so upsetting for so many people around the world is that it is a variation on the classic human fear of home invasion, and the imagery lends itself to supernatural explanations. After this first experience during young adulthood, I would have many more over the years of my life continuing into adulthood. The nature of shadow people is ever-changing. They were always threatening at first, like the first experience that I had in the college apartment, until I fully accepted that I would be visited by them during the night at random times. They seemed to want to invent new ways to surprise me. In a way, the shadow people are kind of like real people, because their own motivations and behaviors vary so wildly. They emerge from the shadows on my walls or any area of the room, though they seem to prefer my closet. I try to never sleep facing away from my closet because of this. They can look like men, women, or children of all ages, and can be single or multiple. However, they are always only black silhouettes with no distinct features. The historical majority are entirely human, but some appear to be humanoid creatures. Some wear clothing, but others do not. They may present different body language, depending on their personality. Things that the shadow people don't do include making sound and interacting with physical objects, including touching me in the room. Strangely, whenever they are present, I get the feeling that they cannot touch or otherwise directly interact with me because I know that they are not real. I have no idea what it would feel like to be touched by one of them but I do know that I would never want to find out. The shadow people don't seem to acknowledge the concept of personal space and would just as soon stand anywhere in the room as inches from my face. They usually observe me and will sometimes attempt interaction. When multiple shadow people are present, they are able to sense interact with each other. The majority of the shadow people that I experience are, for lack of a better term, telepathic. They are able to project feelings and narratives into my mind, along with forcing me to feel their presence. Thus, I am able to understand their motivations, even though they cannot speak to me, and to know when they are in my bedroom relative to me, even when I can't see them. The feelings and narratives can be anything from, I am only here to observe you, to, I don't really want or need to be here, to, I enjoy making you feel threatened. They can be curious, shy, 
funny, friendly, mischievous, or even unaware of me altogether. The majority are benign in the sense that they have no malicious intent. However, the telepathy can be extremely disturbing when a shadow person does have the malicious intent, as it will project feelings of terror and doom into my mind. As typical as some behaviors are of types of shadow people, some people just don't seem to follow the established rules. These are just examples of unique ones that I have experienced. One non-human creature, similar to a combination of a dog slash human or a werewolf. It sat on the edge of my bed, just past my left leg with a hostile, hunched over body posture that animals make when they think that you're a threat. A taller, angular adult male with limbs and fingers too long and several accompanying children. It signaled that they were the only there to briefly observe me and that they didn't mean to disturb me. Very polite and non-hostile, appeared from and disappeared back into my closet. It was almost like a school teacher with students on a field trip. A slender young woman in the flowing gown with arms that ended in asymmetrical claws, resembling tree branches and a head like a combination of a dog's and a human's. She stood with the haunched posture, mostly still near the foot of my bed, but I could tell from her telepathic broadcast that she was waiting for me to look away and that she wanted to harm me somehow. She thought of herself as some kind of huntress. During the fall of 2016, I had a new development. I'd begun hearing loud noises while waking up, like gunshots, rumbling, metallic banging, roaring, human screams, or doors opening and slamming. Having already experienced the shadow people for something like a decade, my first thought was something along the lines of, well, it looks like these little butts are up to new tricks. Oh well, nothing new. After this happened a few times, I googled and found exploding head syndrome, which perfectly describes what I experience and is even known to have an overlap with those who experience sleep paralysis. I don't know why it took so damn long for my brain to start thinking that it hears these things, but I'm not really surprised by it at all. As I've said above, the hallucinations during my waking sleeping transitions are ever-changing. Then, after the development of sound, things took a turn for the weird, dark, and scary. During a fairly recent sleep paralysis incident in the winter of 2016, I was visited by what I can only describe as a shadow person in the form of a disembodied voice. I was sleeping on my left side, facing towards my bedroom window and away from my closet. The darker part of my room and my closet was over my right shoulder. As I was transitioning to wakefulness, I felt that familiar presence of a shadow person but was surprised by the amount of hatred that it projected for me. It was very specific and personal. I sensed the presence coming closer in my bedroom, to the point of being just over my right shoulder and ear. Of course, as in all cases, I was in that state of paralysis, and thus was unable to turn to look to see the form of the shadow person. I got the feeling that this shadow person was unhappy with me, unhappy with being in my room, and wanting to physically harm me despite being unable to do so. Typical. But then, to my absolute shock, amazement and terror, the shadow person began speaking to me. The voice was my own, but forced into a low growl, saturated with pure hate. It was extremely verbally abusive, saying things like, If you don't think I'm real, why don't you turn over and look at me? You're a coward, a liar, and you lie to yourself about us. Why are you surprised? You didn't think that we could talk to you. You're stupid and pathetic. You think you've accepted us, but you know nothing about us. Per the usual, I jolted awake and screamed things back at the presence, which had by then vacated. I was just so shocked that a shadow person had spoken to me and that it had done so in such an abusive way that it was almost like going through the experience of initial exposure all over again. To say the least, this incident seriously disturbed me and led me beginning to write what you read now. During this, I never visually saw what this speaking shadow person looked like, and I'm glad for that. Speaking shadow person being a product of my mind, if you're still in my subconscious somewhere and can read what I'm typing, go screw yourself. As I wrote the majority of all the above, problems began to develop. Thinking and writing about my history with these experiences for a few days in a row, 
during February of 2017 trigger the EHS and the shadow people hallucinations often, and I was woken up several times per night by them. This went on for about a week or so and became increasingly disruptive. Then I set into motion the worst shadow person incident that I have ever experienced when I made the mistake of discussing the writing of the story with my online gaming clan on our VOIP channel. I discussed them at length and especially in the aspect that thinking about them directly correlated with the frequency of their appearances. I then wondered aloud about why the shadow people could not touch me when they could not affect my other senses, such as sight and sound. That very same night, I fell asleep in my bed on my stomach after getting kind of drunk. As I was beginning to wake and entered the familiar state of paralysis, I heard a series of door slamming noises and footsteps approaching my room. Even though I couldn't see, I sensed the presence of a shadow person, a young adult woman with malicious intent. She entered the bedroom and to my horror, surprise approached the bed and climbed on top of my back in an unwelcome and uncomfortable way. I was shocked to feel a sensation of her knees resting on my shoulder blades and her weight pressing down on me. Her skin felt like human skin. I'm not sure what I would have expected and still not sure what to make of this. Bending down over me, she whispered taunting things into my ear from behind me and repeatedly laughed at me. She said things like, I am here. We are all still here. Your mind is not your own. You are ours to torment. Her laughter wasn't jovial or friendly at all, but icy. After waking up from this disturbing experience, it was at that point that I realized that I was uncomfortable continuing to write about this aspect of my history, because thinking about it so much was actively causing more intense and disturbing hallucinations with malicious tones. So I stopped. I think it took about a month for me to revisit and complete this. This brings us to the present time. I haven't really seen many shadow people since the incident with the last speaking, touching woman, and certainly none as unique as her or other malicious speaking hallucinations. I now believe that thinking about these additional abilities of speech and touch may have in turn given my brain the idea to include those abilities in the hallucinations. I've been up for about four hours longer than I should have writing this through the night. I'm going to take a nap before work, and I'll sure as hell sleep on my back. Okay, I know you know a lot about Dogman, so I'm writing to you, asking for some help, and maybe even your viewers can help me. I have a barn, probably about a quarter mile away from my house, and for whatever reason, stray cats love my land, and it never fails. Every spring, there always seems to be a new litter of kittens and cats that show up, so I always make it a thing to go out to the old barn and lay out some food and old blankets so they can make themselves a comfy home. I use some of the leftover straw and hay to kind of make it their own. Well, one night it was particularly windy and raining really hard, so I worry about them and wanted to make sure those little guys had plenty of food for the night since it had been a few days since I checked up on them and I didn't want them to go hungry or cold. I grabbed my flashlight and I walked out there and as I get close to the barn, I'm hearing the cat start to go crazy, and I'm thinking to myself, what on earth? As I reach close to the barn, the door of it flings open, and this short, stubby little dogman, no more than four and a half feet tall, runs out and stares at me right in the face, like a deer, caught in the headlights kind of look. I noticed immediately the dead cat in its mouth, and two more in its hands. It just stares at me for a quick second, not moving a muscle, as if frozen, like caught up doing something that it shouldn't. While holding on to all three dead cats, it flies down onto all fours and sprints off into the darkness far beyond the barn. Without even hesitating, I run into the barn to make sure the cats are okay, and there are a few missing, which wasn't too abnormal. They come and go at night and day, but in all, there is around eight or so and I was only seeing about four during this time. Usually, this time of night is when they all congregate in the barn and sleep, so I don't know if they're from the same litter or what, 
but either way, their numbers continued to shrink after that. The lowest the number got was probably one or two cats that I ever kept seeing, and the other ones kind of just disappeared after that. But like I said, there was always at least one or two cats around, no matter what. I don't know for sure if that dogman saw that it was a free meal and broke in, or what. I want to hunt that thing down, but if it's a young one, that means there's probably a mom and a dad somewhere close by, and I really don't want to feel parental wrath because I obliterated their child with a 12 gauge for going after my cats. Anyway, I want to mention to you that I've had a few other encounters with dogmen, which is why I know about them, and for whatever reason, there's this connection between me and them now to where I encounter them on somewhat of a timely basis. It's very strange. It's like once you see one or have an encounter with one, or more than encounter, it's like once you see one or have an encounter with one, more encounters will follow suit, and I'm not sure why that is. I was an avid Indian artifact hunter. Service finds only though. I got out of college classes early that day and decided to give it a go in a creek I hadn't been over for some time. As I drove down into the area, I noticed a pickup parked with two gentlemen sitting on the tailgate in the shade from the hot sun. The truck was a Ford, two-tone in color, white over brown. I asked them if they were practicing as to where so I could stay out of their road. They said there was a special deer season open and they were tracking one. I walked to a different place than I had planned to hunt and told them where I would be. I walked over to the creek and started in. I guess I was into the area, maybe 50 yards, and the truck didn't waste any time spinning up the hill. They came north and one guy jumped out and the other guy drove on north and got out. I found this a little disturbing and decided they might be hunting me. I climbed out of the creek in short order and was about to walk back to my truck and leave. As I came over the bank, there was this creature sitting on the ground, leaning against a tree. It could have been 12 feet tall if it was standing up. I was only 20 feet from this thing. It was an oaf looking creature sitting on its butt with its back against a large oak tree. It was sleeping with its hands and fingers locked together, stretched out across its knees. It was sleeping there with massive amounts of leaves and its very long, brownish hair, which covered it head to toe, including the face, and it didn't seem to matter what color or shade they were. The hair seemed to blend in perfectly. I'm wondering if its hair is hollow like a deer's hair. I honestly was completely shocked, and all the hair on my body rose to attention. I recognized this thing from pics and magazines and such. I felt nauseous and confused. As I hopped back into the creek out of sight from it, it rose and bolted east right in the direction of those guys. I heard it cut across the gravel on the road, and that was it. It never went back to that creek. I had an absolutely terrifying dinner over at my girlfriend's parents' house just a few years ago. My girlfriend's parents live out in the high desert, and near their house, there is a large canyon that feeds into a smaller river down at the bottom. Since it is high desert, there's lots of locust trees, mild brush, and it's fairly open with only minor tree coverage. I know sometimes they will get coyotes and possibly even mountain lions, but I don't really know what else. I mention these things to you because I'm not exactly sure what we encountered that night. Whatever it was spooked the hell out of my girlfriend and her parents and I. It hasn't happened since to my knowledge, but either way, it was quite the experience. So we are over for dinner, having a great time socializing with her parents, and we had just finished having dessert. We're sitting around her living room talking when we begin to hear coyotes off in the distance. We all just sit there quietly, and I mentioned to her father that, wow, the coyotes are really acting up tonight, I see. And he just kind of chuckles and says, yeah, you'll hear them quite often, and they'll usually yip and yap from time to time. About three or so seconds later, we all heard the most powerful and horrific wolf howl we have ever heard. Or at least that's the closest animal we could attach it to. 
It sounded like a wolf howl, but on steroids. It was so loud. We all looked at each other confused when her father and I both, at the same time, said, What the hell was that? And we'd get up to try and look out the window, but nothing. It sounded so close by, but it's so dark outside, and her parents only have seldom lights around their property. I asked him if there's any wolves around here, and he said there hasn't been any for a long time. But he said that howl sounded like it came from something bigger than a wolf. This is where things get even creepier. We continue on with the night in conversation, and probably a good 15 or 20 minutes later, that pack of coyotes was much closer to the house. This time, they started to go off in a crying, crazy frenzy, whimpering in a giant chorus of coyotes. Her dad and I were bamboozled at what the hell we were hearing, and so both of us stepped outside to see if we can get any sort of clue or inkling to what was going on, but nothing. We could tell that these coyotes were often in the wood line, whooping and hollering and making all sorts of racket. We figured that they had gotten a kill, which is why all the commotion was going on around the distant. But this sounded different than your typical coyote whooping and hollering. They were afraid and crying, yipping and yapping and whining. It was strange and very disturbing to say the least. Her father and I stood outside listening for some time with my girlfriend begging us to come back in and that she did not feel safe while me and him tried to comfort her, telling her it was all right. It went quiet after a while, and we sat there, talking, trying to speculate what it was we were hearing exactly and what was going on. I found it fascinating, even though I was a little creeped out, I'm not going to lie. That's when all the hairs on my head and arms started to stand up, like I felt like I was in danger. Once again, her father broke the silence and said, Do you feel that? And I said, what? He said, we need to go inside now. We're being watched. Without hesitating, I took both steps inside the house and asked him, by what? And I'll never forget the way he looked me in the eyes with the most stern and serious expression and just told me, I don't know. The rest of the night, my girlfriend and I just sat down and watched some Netflix to try and forget about the whole thing. I'm not too sure what her father and mother did, but I'm assuming they kept busy inside because neither of them went back out. I think things quieted down or so, I think. The next morning, her father woke me up in a daze and said, you gotta come see this now. Still dazed and groggy from waking up on a funky REM cycle spot, my girlfriend and I stumbled up out of bed to see what her dad was talking about. All along the large pasture, just a little ways out from their house in perfect view, was a clear view of this coyote bloodbath. There were dead coyotes strung all throughout the field. We all said a few choice words that I'm not going to repeat, but you can guess them. We ran out to the field to properly assess the damage and we noticed that these coyotes had literally been torn to pieces. I'm not talking about just one or two coyotes. I'm talking about at least a dozen or so, it looked like. There were more chunks of flesh and meat than there were whole coyotes. There were more chunks of flesh and meat than there were whole coyotes. I don't have an explanation for what happened, but I know it really bothered my girlfriend's father, based on his reactions and him kind of shutting down for the rest of the day. I had to pitch in and give him a hand on cleaning up that mess, and what a shit show that was, but we got it done. I really don't have an explanation for what happened and I kind of just like to play it off as an overly aggressive mountain lion that got too close to those coyotes over food or something, but I'll never really know. Plus, there's really no explanation for that loud howl that we heard. I'm just thankful that I don't have any of that where I live and I don't have to deal with it. My name is Amber Lee and I live here in Asheville, North Carolina, with my dog, Captain. Captain is the love of my life. He's an Alaskan Klee Husky with a mostly black coat, but with streaks of white fur around his legs and face, not to mention little rings of dark fur around his pale blue eyes that make him kind of look like the Hamburglar. I rescued him from a shelter when he was just a puppy, 
right after my fiance moved up to Hong Kong for work. He helped me through the initial loneliness on nights when I just couldn't handle getting into an empty bed for the 50th time, and in the years that followed when my husband decided he would be better off starting a family with a Chinese woman he met through his job. Captain helped me through the heartbreak. Captain is a big guy, a subwoofer. While other dogs need walks, Captain needs hikes. Which is why, every weekend for the past few years, I would drive him out to a national forest, Nantala to be exact. One of the few places he could really be. Dogs just aren't meant to be cooped up indoors. They need to run. They need to explore. They need a place like this. And coincidentally, so did I. This national forest was a place I could really lose myself. A place to escape the pressure of high pressure, high paying job. The woods were a place of sanctuary to me, but that all changed one chilly October day when I came to realize that there is a damned good reason why human beings have walled themselves off in towns and cities. Because the wilderness, it seems, is not our friend. Captain was always his happiest in the woods. For such a majestic animal, he has an uncanny ability to act goofy as hell, and the woods brought that out of him in spades. He'd be so lost in the feeling of pure freedom, his blue eyes all wide with his tongue lolling out to one side of his mouth, riding the wave of zoomies that inevitably had me laughing at how dorky he acted. So, you could imagine how quickly I noticed a change in his behavior. How he went from being such a loud, boisterous dog to a quivering, whining wreck that barely ventured a few feet away from me at any one time. And all the time I'd been taking Captain out to this forest, I'd never seen him act in such a way. And when I laid a hand on his neck to give him a stroke, I discovered he was actually trembling in fear. My first thought was that a mountain lion could have been in the area, but a previous encounter with what I'd figure was a predator's scent trail had caused Captain to bark incessantly and become overly aggressive. Now, this was back in the fall of last year, and that during the previous summer, the National Forest had seen a sharp increase in black bear activity, with homeowners being encouraged to be much more careful. Surrounding issues of food disposal, it was entirely possible that Captain had sniffed out a mama bear and cubs, in which he was outright terrified. I had no idea what to make of such a situation. But one thing was clear though, Captain wanted out, and consequently, so did I. There was only one big problem with such a plan. We'd already spent like two hours hiking in the woods. Getting out would not be quick or easy. With every step, the tension grew. Captain, looking behind me with wild, terrified eyes, darting ahead before doubling back to whine at me. Each footstep seemed a little quicker than the last, my utter paranoia growing to fever pitch as I continually looked behind me and continually saw nothing. But something was behind us. Captain knew it, and I could feel it. At one point, he bound back to my side and froze, staring off into the dense forest as he sniffed at the air before him. I thought the worst was over, but I was horribly, horribly wrong. With a yelp so loud, it hurt my ears. He burst off through the trees ahead, howling barks, punctuating his canine gallop. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the trees behind me, and with a terror so rampant, I could still feel it to this day. I heard something behind me breathing, and it was huge. I just ran, following the sound of Captain's barks, crashing through the dense trees as dry branches tore at the bare skin on my face. There are many times in my life where I'd been uncomfortable, anxious, or scared. This experience dwarfed them all. No emotion can compare to that knowing you're being hunted by something, something that you cannot reason or bargain with. Something that will crunch your bones into meal and not feel a damned thing. I ran harder and longer than I ever have in my life. So intensely that when I finally had to stop to draw breath, I found myself dry retching against a tree trunk out of exhaustion, out of fear, out of pure biological imperative, making me as light and mobile as possible. 
but there could be no respite. Captain's furious barks made that abundantly clear. We had to keep moving. It was that or be eaten alive. With tears in my eyes, I carried on running, hurtling through the forest, the thickets so dense I was running half blind, which was made painfully obvious when I caught my foot on a fallen tree trunk and was set flying into the dirt. The impact alone knocked the wind out of me with an ugly grunt, and as I rolled onto my back, struggling for breath, I saw a captain appear at my side. He had been my hero so many times before and wasn't about to fail me now. His barks were wild, full of rage, his sharp teeth exposed as he poured the raw force of his being into the woods behind us. It was terrifying, awe-inspiring to behold, and in that moment, I thanked God that he was on my side. But not even Captain could maintain the display, for when the unseen thing hunting us seemed to roar back through the trees, Captain was silenced. He rushed over to me, taking the collar of my waterproof coat between his teeth and trying to drag me along the forest floor. But I was renewed, by terror, by biological imperative, by the damn raw need to survive. In an instant, I was back on my feet, running, panting, scrambling for life. I remember there being a moment when I was terrified that Captain might leave me, how the fear might prove too much for him to handle. There was so much of the forest for him to escape into, but he never once failed to double back and find me. Even when he was out of sight, he made sure to continue barking furiously so I'd know exactly where to run to. That was until I burst through a set of particularly thick bushes to find Captain stood stationary at a riverbank. It wasn't all that wide or all that deep, but it was enough of an obstacle to halt his progress. You see, Captain hated water. I don't know if it was something that happened to him as a puppy before we adopted him from the shelter, but Captain has always hated water. Pools, rivers, lakes, you couldn't get him to go within six feet of any of them, which is why seeing that river in our way terrified me on a whole new level. Out of pure instinct, I just jumped across. Like I said, it wasn't particularly wide, but the exhaustion of running for so long meant I only barely made the jump. I turned, knowing that Captain wouldn't even attempt the jump without encouragement or direction. My voice was trembling as I spoke. Come on, boy, jump, jump to mama. Please, boy, please jump, mama, come on. It was horrendous, watching his eyes so full of confusion, saying without words, why are you making me do this? I watched him pacing up and down the bank as the thing hunted us grew closer and closer. In the end, I was begging him, pleading with him, promising steak dinners for an entire year if he would only get his ass across the river. For a moment, he froze, sizing up the gap before sprinting off back among the trees. Again, that terrified feeling gripped me. He couldn't do it. He was so terrified of the water that in a moment of pure panic, he'd fled back in the direction of the thing chasing us. It felt like an eternity standing there on the riverbank, praying that he'd reappear, somehow convincing myself that he wouldn't. Only he did. In one glorious moment, he burst from the foliage, hurtling towards the river's edge at breakneck speed. As he reached the bank, his legs unfurled like springs, sending him sailing through the air, high above the river. It's funny the little details you remember from a traumatic event, and one of the things that sticks with me our captain's eyes as he jumped that river. They were huge, these massive pale blue circles that seemed to shine out from rings of black fur around them, almost like he couldn't quite believe what he was doing, and quite frankly, neither could I. I mean it when I say he was like an action hero in some hyperbolic 80s movie. The bravery he displayed is something I feel I can only aspire to. Even his landing was dramatic as hell, he barely made it across and was scrambling up the dirt embankment when I leapt towards him, grabbed him by the collar, and pulled him onto the solid ground. When we were up, he took off again with renewed speed, seemingly more terrified of the water than whatever had been stalking us. I'd had tears in my eyes before, but at that point, I broke down completely, 
calling after him with staggered breathing. Good boy, Captain. Good boy. I continued to run, feeling my thighs burn and my feet ache from what felt like miles upon miles of it. I was so short of breath, so damn exhausted. I thought I might just pass out at any moment. And when I say I could literally hear my own heart beating in my throat, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest. I am not an unfit person either. I dance a lot. I take a spin class. I have stamina. But running an almost constant sprint for the better part of an hour made it feel like my heart was about to explode out of my chest. By the time I'd reached the peak of yet another gentle incline, my legs gave out from under me. I remember seeing silvery white patches appearing in my vision, and no matter how hard I drew breath, I just couldn't seem to get enough oxygen. When I saw something and moving in front of me, something that definitely wasn't Captain, I thought that was it. I thought I'd pass out and never wake up again, having been torn apart by whatever wild animal was chasing us. I woke up in the back seat of a four-seater pickup truck. As soon as I found the strength to sit up, I heard a voice outside the stationary vehicle shout, She's awake. Suddenly, the door opened and a person I'd never seen before in my life was offering me a plastic bottle of water and asking if I was okay. I didn't speak. I just took the water off of him and gulped like three quarters of it down in one long sweet chug. By the time I regained my senses, I was panicking. I couldn't see Captain anywhere. I looked at the stranger, dressed in his hunting gear, and tried to summon the strength to ask him where my dog was. Although the words just wouldn't come out. The look on my face must have told him all he needed to know. When he told me Captain was fine, and he was just inside their hunting lodge getting a bite to eat. I just cried with relief. I was overjoyed he was okay, but that's not what made me burst into tears. The hunter told me that, for a while, Captain wouldn't follow any of them out to the truck, no matter how much meat they offered him. He just stayed at my side, yapping and whining, waiting for me to wake up. For a couple of hours, I joined the hunters in their lodge, eating the hamburger they offered me, slowly, while I regained my strength. I told them exactly what had happened, how Captain had freaked out after we stumbled across what I assumed was a black bear. But black bears are relatively small, certainly not as big as grizzlies, and certainly not as big as whatever had been chasing us through the woods. I raised the issue with them and asked them what they thought it might be. I thought they might have an answer, being seasoned hunters, but they didn't. There was this awkward silence as they exchanged looks before one of them spoke up, telling me they just didn't know. I asked if it was possible that a grizzly bear could make it this far down from the Rockies, with one responding that it was possible. But that was a lie. An outright lie. Those hunters quite possibly saved my life, and for that I will be eternally grateful. But I know they lied to me. Grizzlies don't make it anywhere near North Carolina at any time of the year. I've done a fair amount of research into what was chasing that day, but I've been unable to come up with anything conclusive. The only thing I know for sure is that those hunters were hiding something, and as long as they do, people will continue to go missing in that stretch of North Carolina woodland. Captain is lying next to my computer chair as I write this, ever faithful and ever watchful. And in my darkest moments, I wonder how I'm ever going to last without him. I was riding in the rear seat of a car with three others, all college students. We all lived same house in Fayette. It was a Friday night. Weather called for heavy snow overnight. We all were from the same area, about 25 miles away, decided to head there for a weekend or would be snowed in at Fayette by morning. We headed south in my brother's car. There was four inches of snow on the road, so we were going slow, about 25 miles an hour. I was leaning to the center of rear seat to see out front. I saw something moving in field up ahead, just in headlight range, about 200 feet ahead. It was big and moving towards the road. I hollered, what the hell is that, and elbowed Al, who was sleeping next to me. 
My brother let off gas as we rolled on. We all watched as the creature never broke stride, stepped over a fence at least 40 inches high, into a ditch, across the ditch, up onto the road shoulder, to center road, to other shoulder, across ditch, over another 40 inch high fence, going into darkness as we passed by. It passed in front of us from right to left, about 50 feet away, when it was center of road. It was big, at least eight feet tall, covered from coned head to feet with dark brown hair. It had a barrel-shaped body with long arms and legs. It just walked like a human, taking long strides and swinging its arms. It crossed an angle from northwest to southeast, never turning to look at us, so we did not see its face. After passing, all were in shock, and someone said, let's stop to go look out for it. A big no was the response, and we went on our way. A month ago, I went over with my friends to some state gameland area that's near their house to walk around in because, well, we were bored and we're in quarantine, and there's not much else to do. We just wanted to explore miles upon miles of dense, dark woods. I'm 18 and I thought it would be a fairly good idea if I brought weapons with me and any sort of supplies in case anything happened because we were just wanting to explore and also wanting to do it at night where everything is in the blackness. I would like to think of us as a group of avid explorers. I personally love the thrill of being in danger sometimes and wanted to make sure we were taken care of in case we ran into a cougar or some sort of predator. We got out there pretty far, and we were doing just fine with flashlights and the equipment that we had. We wanted to keep a lookout and make sure that we wouldn't run into any nocturnal animals like skunks or anything like that. The woods that we were traversing through were dense and covered with foliage and short-cut trees, but we were determined to get as much out of the night as we could. And the further we went into the wilderness without anything happening, the braver we became and the hungrier we got for a thrill. At one point or another, we came to a dead deer, a buck at that that was partially eaten. It looked fresh too, and we were amazed at the size of this buck and how it was torn open. We got creeped out because that meant there was either a cougar around or a bunch of coyotes, both being something we weren't really wanting to deal with. As we were checking out this carcass with our flashlights and looking at it a little more, we hear a crunching of leaves behind us, and we all shone our lights. The first thing we saw is huge white teeth glistening in the light, and a gaping snout full of dripping saliva. That's when we quickly noticed the glowing amber eyes shortly above it, and that these teeth belonged to whatever it is we were looking at. We were looking at a real-life werewolf in front of us and we didn't stick around to see what was going to happen. I think we all booked it out of there so fast we probably made a dust storm. We booked it so fast and never looked back to see if this thing was following us, but I don't think it ever did. We got back to our cars and floored it out of there so fast. I used to think that monsters didn't exist, but I feel like that night I was proven wrong. I don't know what the hell is out there that looks exactly like a werewolf, but whatever it was we ran into, I'm sorry this encounter is so brief, but there's not a whole lot to it other than what we saw and that we booked it. I can't give you more specific exact details because it was just so quick, but I can tell you confidently that all four of us saw exactly the same thing and we collectively speculate that whatever we saw was in the process of possibly eating this dead buck, or was coming upon the corpse to eat since it was still fresh. I believe it growled at us because it thought we were coming to take its food, or even posed a threat, and we weren't about that life, so we ditched. I like to go to Glotch Park and watch the Eagles. I used to stand in the middle of the bridge for a cigarette before I went home from work. I had done this a few days in a row, and that day I got out of my truck and felt like I shouldn't be there. As I walked to the middle of the bridge, I felt very uneasy. I lit my cigarette and stared out over the river. 
I felt like I was being watched, and I started to get scared. It was coming from the other side of the bridge on the right-hand side. Whatever it was, I knew that it was not human, nor an animal, and it was a big male. I felt like he was just curious as to why I went there every day to the same spot and just wanted to watch what I was up to. I looked around and could not see anything. I built up my courage, looked down and started walking slowly to the other side of the bridge. As I started walking, I heard a big crash into the river and saw a huge log floating down. Then I heard a low huff, like someone letting out the air through their nose in frustration with a little noise from the throat. The log had dried vegetation on it, so I knew it was laying on the forest floor. I don't know how many pounds it was, but it was huge. The biggest guy I know wouldn't have been able to throw this thing in the river with little to no effort. I looked to where it came from and saw nothing. I slowly turned around and walked slowly back to my truck. I wanted to run, but I didn't want it to run after me if I ran. I got into my truck and took off. I was scared and shaken. I haven't been out on that bridge by myself ever since. This happened to me back when I was a kid in the 90s. Because of what happened on this lake, I'm not going to mention the name. I want people to refrain from going here. It's dangerous. My family and I were the only ones here at this time. I'll give you a hint. This was on one of the mountains up in the Pacific Northwest. I can tell you that much. We were with our cousins and my aunt and uncle. Around this area is also several smaller ponds that we believe the lakes feed into underground, but we're not quite sure. The lake itself is surrounded by tons of timber and is beautiful and full of solitude. Me and a few of my cousins couldn't wait to go and jump in the lake. It was a hot day in July, and after eating some good barbecue burgers and hot dogs, we were ready to take a good swim. There was actually a rope swing on one of the rocks on the east side of the lake that was a little higher up than the rest, and almost acted as the perfect jumping plateau to use the rope to jump into the lake. My cousins and I had a blast jumping in and out of the water a few times here and there, and just gallivanting around. I remember at that point, my cousin guessed that I couldn't swim all the way across the lake, which I clearly couldn't because I wasn't in that kind of shape. So being kids, I was like, bet you can't swim as far as I can, and we raced each other. My cousins were able to outswim me by probably 40 to 50 feet, and I started really losing momentum and power after a little while. I had to stop to catch my breath, and so all the while, I'm hovering there in the water while I'm watching my cousins swim far beyond me and competing amongst themselves to see if they can get to the other side of the shore. This lake was not humongous by any means, but it was easily 200 feet across if I had to take a wild guess. I'm probably wrong on that guesstimate, but I'm just trying to give you somewhat of a painted picture of how big this lake was. I'm watching my cousins floating there in the water and laughing at how hard they are trying to outswim each other when I felt something scaly brush against my left foot. I looked down, but it was too murky to see anything, and immediately, my thoughts went to a trout, because this lake was used for all sorts of fishing. Well, I think more just trout than anything else, but even my family had brought fishing poles, and my uncle, who was an avid fisherman, has fished in here before, and has caught some great tasting trout. Anyway, I bring my attention back to my cousins, who've almost made it to the other side of the shore, or so it looks like. That's when the nightmare began. The whole situation is just a bit of a blur, but I can remember distinct details here and there. Let me explain. I don't think it was more than just a few seconds after watching my cousins almost fully ascend on the opposing shoreline when what I can describe to you as a scaly-like hand grabbed my ankles tightly and pull me down underneath the surface of the water. I submerged quickly, and in a panic, looked down to see what the hell had grabbed me, thinking it was maybe one of my cousins or so pulling a prank. Even though the water was murky like a lake would, the sun was about directly overhead, giving more light shining through, which meaning luck was on my side. Looking down into the water, 
I saw the most horrific looking reptilian face and it greeted me underneath with its jaws agape and sharply pointed alligator like teeth as both of its hand had clasped onto both my ankles. At that moment, it's like my heart came to a stop and I froze. I mean, not just me, time itself stood still. My brain was trying to digest and understand what was this thing grabbing me and pulling me under the water, but my brain simply couldn't process what it was seeing. Even though the water was murky, I was still able to make out the general look at what this thing was under the water. Even with the sunlight up above, this might sound like it dragged on for a while, but I promise this only occurred within a couple of seconds because after it grabbed me, it kept trying to pull me down more and more. And as soon as it grabbed me, it showed its ugly face and huge teeth, but didn't attempt to bite me like I thought it would. With both of its hands around my ankles, it took me down more and more to where it got just a little darker. Don't get the wrong impression. I wasn't the calm, normal kid that I was during this. In fact, I was freaking out screaming in full panic mode. In fact, I'm actually surprised I didn't drown. I was probably pulled 20 or so feet under the surface because it was getting darker and somehow whatever was pulling onto me must have lost its grip or that's kind of what it felt like because I was kicking so much and with every ounce of adrenaline in my body, I pushed myself to the shore as fast as I could. I think in that moment my mind was probably going blank or short circuiting by panicking so hard that I could not even comprehend reality around me. I don't know if I mentioned it already, but I was only 8 years old at the time. I kicked and used every ounce of energy I possibly had to get myself to shore, but it was roughly a good 40 feet from the shoreline, guessing again of course. My family is freaking out, hysterical and screaming my name because they saw me go under for a few seconds and saw me swimming frantically back out towards the shore, and my cousins who are on the other side of the shore are laughing thinking I'm either pretending or just trying to play a big joke. They didn't get it. What probably only lasted maybe 20 seconds felt like an eternity as I clawed and made my way to shore as hard as I could. I'm not sure that if whatever it was in the water that originally grabbed me never tried to grab me after that, I can't remember, but I made it to shore. After I got to the shallow part of the shore, I pulled myself up to run and noticed both my ankles felt like they were broken. I hadn't noticed, but now that I was trying to run on them, I made it a few steps onto the shore and just collapsed. My family was already rushing over to me to my aid as I lost consciousness. This is what I was told, of course, and a lot of it was a blur to me. I think the brain has a way of wiping traumatic memories from our brains to ensure our sanity, but nonetheless, I felt like I survived. I woke up to my family surrounding me and an EMT checking me out. I guess I had been unconscious for about 12 minutes, the EMT had told me, and even had stopped breathing at times. My mother, hysterically crying and my cousins and all my family were freaking out, trying to figure out what the hell had just happened. I can remember the EMT calmly asking me what happened. In my dazed state, I had tried to recall that something that looked like a giant lizard looking thing grabbed me and pulled me under. My family nor the EMT broke their concerned expression, but all their attention was down at my ankles. Looking down to see what they were looking at, both ankles were not only swollen and bruised, but had the stinging, burning purple marks on them. I don't know how else to describe the phenomenon. I tried to move my feet, but I could barely. The pain was so bad and it was almost like a shooting burning pain. It felt like somebody took a sledgehammer to both my ankles, then put them in a vise and then poured acid on my skin. It was like a chemical burn. It was after that that I spent the next day or so in the hospital, but the doctors couldn't come to a conclusion on what had happened to my ankles. The summary was that I must have brushed up against a log or some sort of fish in which I was horrifically allergic to. That didn't explain my inability to walk for the next few weeks after, and that using crutches or how my ankles were so badly bruised and smashed. I don't want to say smashed, really, but they felt like somebody dropped a rock on them. It was awful. It took a few weeks to recover, but I did, 
and we never ended up going back to that lake again, nor did my family really ask questions about what it saw. My cousins though, they wanted to know exactly what happened and so did my mother. When I looked down into the water, the first thing I remember seeing was these yellow reptilian eyes, followed by a longer reptilian looking face or snout and a huge row of teeth as it opened its jaws. It didn't open its jaws to try and bite me though, like I said earlier. It's like it was looking up at me, opening its mouth and proceeded to grab onto me and pull me down deep into the darkness below, beyond the stretch of light. I fought with everything I had in me, and I don't know why it let go, or if it lost its grip or what, but it did and I never bothered to look back down to see if it was there anymore as I swam my way back to shore. If I had to guess, maybe it was some unknown water amphibian reptile thing. I'm not sure. The hands, when they grabbed me, almost reminded me of a larger version of iguana hands, if that makes sense. I know that can be kind of hard to make out in the moment of fear and being dragged underwater, but it had long spindly lizard scaly fingers. I couldn't recall any claws, but I didn't feel them, and the hands were far bigger than my legs. Whatever it was, it was certainly larger than I. I want to refrain from saying the name of the lake because as popular as it is, I just don't want anyone hearing this and going in there and experiencing the same thing I did when I was a child, and I wish it would just be shut down to be honest. Whatever is in that lake that lives down there, there's more than just fish, that's for sure. And unfortunately, the eerie details don't end quite there. So, a few years later, I guess there were some divers that had gone swimming down in that same lake and discovered that the bottom was over 100 feet deep and featured many small caverns ranging in size from a car to deeper down where the cavern and cavern openings were actually much larger and supposedly even made from lava tubes and such and more than likely they were tunnels that connected to potentially other larger and smaller lakes and ponds nearby underground. The one detail that really makes my blood run cold is that these divers found some decomposing bodies of animals down in some of these water caverns. One being half a deer and a couple of other small animals. Now you tell me, how does a deer carcass get 100 feet down into the lake in one of these smaller caverns? Something had to eat it or put it down there, or better yet, do what alligators do and store their food down at the bottom. My mind went to the thing that pulled me down and stored it as food. I don't know. I'm just trying to guess, but it freaks me out to think about, and I still have nightmares about it. It was a very traumatic experience for me, and I'm thankful that overall, my family is respectful enough not to keep talking to me about it. I think that day, seeing the EMT and the marks on my legs was probably traumatic enough for them that they didn't really need to ask questions, I guess. I was driving home late one night when I saw what looked to be like a large dog or canid-like humanoid thing run across the road in front of me and jumped off the guardrail. The first thing I noticed was a large shape that was standing upright and running on two legs in front of my vehicle, just outside the limits of my headlights. It's been cleared, the road, in only a matter of seconds and leapt off into the night. It was dark and I couldn't make out a fur color but it looked to be a smoky charcoal color gray, if I could put my best guess in. The first thing I noticed was it to have pointed ears in the snout, which is what ultimately gave it away as canid. The disturbing part was that it was running on two legs, and just like a dog would, bound off the side of the road, off the guardrail, like it would if it was on four legs. I know there is such a thing as wild dogs and all that, but Something in my gut just tells me this wasn't a wild dog. It also looked nothing like a wolf or what a wild dog would look like, and it was much larger. Plus, the fact that I don't think any breed of dog can walk steadily on two legs for really any amount of distance, at least not comfortably, without shaking. It freaked me right the hell out, and I kept driving, keeping to my own business, hoping it wasn't planning on coming after me. Never, ever, ever saw it again after that. I'll preface this by saying that my wife is 100% a skeptic. 
She is a very rational, scientific person, and chooses to believe in what is proven and what she can quantify. But I will say, I think that's in part because she doesn't like being scared. She doesn't like scary movies, and she dismisses the idea of ghosts or other cryptids. That being said, a few weeks ago, she woke me up at 3 a.m. saying that she 100% saw someone in our house, that our animals were spooked, and she asked me to search the house. I got my gun from my nightstand and searched the house and checked the doors and windows, and finding no one to return to bed where we discussed what she saw. She says that she woke up and saw the figure of a man walking out of her bedroom door. She even heard the floorboards creak as it walked out. But all of our animals were either on the bed with us or sleeping next to it. Since then, she's seen it almost every night, either leaning into the doorway with a hand on the door frame or fully in the room standing at the foot of the bed. She attempts to rationalize it and eventually falls back asleep, which I hear is common with these kinds of scenarios. The worst one was a few nights ago where she had a terrible dream where I left for work and she felt the creature get into bed with her and put its arm over her as though it was attempting to cuddle. Even skeptics have their limits and she doesn't want to talk about it because it's frightening her and it's not something she could just rationalize anymore. Is there anything I can do to help put her mind at ease? From everything I've read, they very rarely cause any kind of physical harm but I'm worried that this might do her mentally. We have a 10-month-old son, and she works nights, so her on and off days, she's forced to maintain normal day hours and has trouble sleeping through the night because she's normally awake then. To start off, I live on the East Coast in Central Virginia, and the property I live on contains 10 acres of fields and woods. Just as some background info, the property was once a battleground during the Civil War. A historical battle took place right around where I live. My friends and I have always seen ghosts and paranormal activity around the property whenever we hang out or camp, but that isn't why I'm telling you this. I should probably mention that our campsite contains tarp roofs with pallets set up as walls. I should also mention that we always carry firearms with us in the woods. but. I'm always enforceful about making sure nobody has any bullets chambered in their weapons unless they have a reason to shoot. One night, in late April, three friends and I were hanging out by the fire within our campsite. At about 11.30 p.m., one of my buddies and I wandered down the trail with no flashlights of any sort in the dark. We stopped at an opening by the field where we could see the stars. We chatted about random topics for about 10 minutes until we start hearing steps and twigs snapping in multiple areas in front of us. We are skeptical, but keep an ear out. Then all of a sudden, I yell, and uncharacteristically, rack a bullet in the chamber of my rifle as quick as I can. Then, I immediately aim my rifle towards what I'm seeing. It was dark, so I couldn't distinguish details, but this is what I saw. It was a pale, white silhouette. It was crawling uphill from another trail. It didn't seem intimidating though, rather intently curious. Its body moved similar to the way a chicken bobs its head, but more subtle. My friend and I yelled for our other two friends to come assist us as the creature got closer. We yelled louder. We weren't terrified, simply frightened and in awe. The creature went behind a tree and repeatedly poked its head out and back behind the tree. It occasionally began to crawl towards us from behind the tree, but would retreat once again. All its movement were slow and agile, and after about two minutes, it disappeared, as in we couldn't see it because of the brush, but it probably fled into the woods. Our other two friends arrived a minute or so after the creature had already fled. Their excuse was that they thought we had ran into a hunter or somebody so they decided to take the bullets out of their weapons. Anyway, the next day we went back to the spot of the sighting and we found disturbed leaves and tracks exactly where we saw the creature. The friend I was with during the sighting is a skilled hunter and tracker. We followed the tracks that led towards off the property until it seemed to either go cold or we lost them altogether. 
we did find a small-sized goat skull in the woods with no carcass to follow near the sighting area. Does anyone know what this could possibly be? The closest thing it resembles that I can think of is the rake creature. I'll start off by saying no, this isn't my story, but it was such a crazy enough encounter that I have asked each of my friends throughout the years to recount the events. This happened around the year 2000. After about a year after this took place, I started dating one of these friends, and that's when I first heard about this dog-wolf story. I have since asked each friend, over years and miles apart, and they all remember the exact same encounter. Before my ex was even my boyfriend, let's call him Jay, he and our other friends were about 18 years old. At that age, I remember it being an adventure to find a place to smoke. Let's go hike to so-and-so and smoke. Ah, the good old days when we got away from our parents and planned a day around smoking. It was Jay and his best friend B, and their girlfriends S and M. The four of them decided to drive to Mount Pitska, a beautiful wooded area outside of Eugene, Oregon. It's more of a hill, but it's nature in its prime for sure. I've been out there many times growing up, and I know exactly what trail they were on and the main one that connects the parking lot to the river. They had driven in B's little white sedan, parked in the parking lot, and then walked to the river. On the way to the river from the lot, there is a very small bridge that crosses a small creek, which is relevant for later. The group spent the day out there swimming and puffing, puffing and swimming, just being typical Oregonian teens. I can imagine that hunger is what drove them to go home after a few hours as the sun began to set. Either activity alone is bound to get somebody hungry, let alone both. So they walked along the well-worn main dirt path to the parking lot. This path has since been paved, according to Google Maps. It doesn't take but 20 minutes or so for them to get back to the little footbridge by the parking lot that they had crossed when they hiked in. When they reached the small footbridge near the parking lot, B looked out into the vast field between them and the wooded mountain and noticed a huge dog near the tree line, about 100 yards away. They all later described it as the biggest dog they had ever seen. The dog was just sitting there, not looking scary, just looking like a humongous, friendly dog. It was starting to get dark from M and J's descriptions and the drawing she did for me later in 2005. It was very shaggy and furry. I may even still have that notebook where she drew the dog thing. If I find it, I'll send it to you. My friends continued to walk across the small wooden bridge and one of the girls screamed. The big dog was now on its hind legs, standing much closer than they had seen it before. It had traversed most of the large field in seconds it took them to get across this 10 foot long bridge. Whatever this was, it was fast quiet and stealthy. My four friends ran to the car and they had the classic cliche, I can't get the key in, because B was fumbling madly for the keys. At this point, the dog was standing on its hind legs at the very edge of the parking lot, looking at them. Still had the dog face, still had the dog body, just standing up. They never saw it walking on all four or just two. It was like every time they looked up, it was just standing there closer. As Jay had said, every time they looked up, he was closer but not moving. All of them recounted how surreal it was to see a dog standing on its hind legs. I don't know if it ran for a few ticks and then stood up again at intervals in the field, but that's the way they describe it. Many times I asked them, are you sure it wasn't a bear? No, it was definitely a dog standing on its hind legs a big dog that was stalking them. Also, this is in Lane County, Oregon in the year 2000. There are few if any bear out there at all. It would be odd, but then again, I wasn't there. The kids got into the car and sped off, leaving the dog to his own business. I've never had a reason to doubt any of their stories. In fact, S doesn't like to talk about the incident at all because it's just far too creepy for her to recall. My older cousin has served time 
and not only in the military, but also specific branches of government that deal with things hidden to the public eye. He has gone on several diving missions with other very experienced divers, experiencing strange creatures, and nearly dying, but that's for another story that I'll have to tell you later. He has had other run-ins with things that are not supposed to exist, and it's even had a couple Bigfoot counters here and there. But today, I'm going to be telling you about how he had encountered a dogman nest, or so he tells me, when he had gotten hired by a secret security firm to survey an area of land due to an unforeseen threat, is what they called it. My cousin had been hired several times by multiple companies as a quote-unquote cleanup person. He's kind of a jack of all trades and has had his hands in quite a few endeavors, including being sent out to kill several mountain lions and packs of coyotes, some that were dangering nearby communities' farms and livestock, but then again, that's not the point of why I'm writing to you. My cousin, see, he refuses to tell me the exact location, but says it's somewhere between Ohio and Kentucky, and that he was in the thick of the wilderness surveying this specific area. My cousin wasn't the type of person to ask questions. Usually, he was just given an assignment and an order, and that was it. He was only given a few basic supplies with his most prized tool on a journey, a machete. He made it to a certain point where he told me that he was able to tell just by the look of the wilderness alone that man had never stepped in this area before and that he was the first human to be in those woods. The further he got in, the thicker the brush got and the harder it became for him to get in. He told me even the atmosphere around him had started to change in a negative way. When asking him what he meant by that exactly, he could only explain that it got harder to breathe and he could feel the presence of something else, meaning he was not alone. After continuing on further and further, getting closer to the coordinates he was given, he stumbled upon what looked like a large den, half shallow cavern and half built out of dirt. He said it was just kind of there and the opening was enormous, around eight to nine feet high and about five feet in width and was large enough that he could just basically walk in. He said you could just smell death emanating from every corner of this small cave. Being outside the entrance, you could even smell it more. Even though every fiber in his being was screaming to not go in, he said he felt like there was just this mysterious force pulling him in and drawing him in as if he had no control over his own body. Taking his flashlight on and out and gripping his machete, he made his way about 20 feet when the cavern inside opened up to a much larger area. He said if he had to guess, it was probably about 30 feet high and a room that's roughly 50 yards across from where he was standing to the back wall. He said the smell of rotting animal and wet dog was so bad that he could hardly breathe and couldn't be in there long. After quickly shining his light around, there were so many bones, he said. He saw so many skulls and bone piles. Animals, of course. He had no doubt in his mind that this was indeed the den of some large predator. Probably a wolf or a pack of wolves. He said he was the only one in there for a handful of seconds because besides the smell, he had this horrible feeling like he just shouldn't be in there and that he should leave now. Quickly exiting the cave, he made his way another 10 or so miles to the designated coordinates he was given, but said he was followed the rest of the way there. He said he could feel the presence of something quickly growing around him. It felt malicious. It became apparent more and more that he needed to get out of there and quickly and reach his coordinates. He explained to me that whatever it was was following him, was tracking him like prey, but wasn't coming in close enough to reveal itself. He thought that to be odd, considering whatever it was clearly possessed enough strength and stamina to pounce on him and take him down. He believes that whatever it was also lived in the den that he had discovered, and that there were multiple of whatever this was following him wherever he was going. This went on until he reached his coordinated points where a helicopter had come to pick him up after using a special signalized device. 
Upon being picked up, and as he was going up in the air, he said he looked down and could see these tall, what he would describe as werewolf-looking beings, standing and somewhere crouching just beyond the wood line, invisible if you were on foot, but totally exposed once you were in the air. Because of how spread apart the trees were in this clearing, since it was obviously big enough for a helicopter to land, he was able to see these beings very clearly. Said there was probably about seven or eight of them, and that they were pitch black, and instead on two legs, and resembled that of what you would see off of a Hollywood horror movie. Frightened, he did keep it to himself, but he told me that this wasn't his first rodeo, since he has had other strange encounters with weird beings like Bigfoot and other stuff. I'll be sure to send you that story about his diving experience and encountering something unknown. I've always felt I've had this sight since a child. There is a room in my grandmother's house called the Red Eye Room. Apparently, my family has been calling it that for years because a being with red eyes will climb on top of you while sleeping and stare at you. I had this happen and felt and saw the bed sag from the weight, and all I could do was scream. Fast forward to now, I'm 25, I woke up out of a dead sleep, and I see red eyes reaching towards me with a beaming smile, and before he reaches me, I scream, and he evaporates. I ran out of my house, I believe he may be in my closet as funny as that sounds, but I see my hangers move sometimes, and nothing could be disturbing them but an outside force. Not sure if it's menacing, but it's never spoken to me or made a noise. Just watched me. This happened when I was just 12 years old and might take some backstory for it to make sense. So at the time, I was a young girl about to start high school. Now I had some anxiety from the stress of changing schools and some family trouble which didn't make things any easier for me. So my mother is from Nova Scotia, and my father is from Europe. We were staying in a cabin in Nova Scotia. I won't say exactly where, but it was a place where we stayed almost every summer, so I was used to sleeping there. This cabin is located on the water, with another property on one side, and a patch of forest on the other. This happened one day in August, but I can't seem to remember the exact date. At the time, my father was just away for the night to visit a friend, so it was just me, my twin sister, who we'll just call Annabelle, and my little brother, we'll call him Thomas, and my mother Amanda, of course, not their real names. So I was listening to something on my iPad, I don't remember what, and looking out the window at the forest. For the longest time, it was just forest. Nothing for me to be alarmed about. But after an hour or so, I saw something in the woods. At first, I thought it was just the reflection of car headlights on the leaves. But when I kept looking at it, I realized that they were eyes. Two large, gray, oval-shaped eyes. I didn't know what to do at first. I was paralyzed. I slowly walked away from the window and the eyes shifted their gaze as whatever it was disappeared into the woods. I was shaken, but decided not to tell anyone, and tried to rationalize it as just being a reflection, as I had thought before. I didn't see anything else for the rest of the night, but the next morning is when I really got a scare. I was sleeping in a room with my brother and my mother, while my sister slept down the hall. It was very hot, so I was having trouble sleeping. At around 4 o'clock in the morning, I had a dream. It was one of those dreams where you were just running, but you don't really know why. Except this time, I did know what I was running from. I didn't even need to look back to know what I was running from. It was the creature from the woods, and it was chasing me in all fours from the sound of it. The dream only lasted a few seconds, but the worst part was when I woke up. My heart was beating faster than it ever had, and I couldn't open my eyes no matter how hard I tried. It felt as though something was holding them closed. All I could hear was my heart beating, but I could also hear this other sound. It sounded like heavy raspy breaths mixed with shrill screaming. After about 15 seconds, that felt like 15 minutes. 
I could open my eyes again, but I almost wish I hadn't. When I opened my eyes, I saw a tall, seven-foot creature slowly going out the door of the room. The creature's skin was a light gray and looked not scaly, but almost like that of a frog. Its mouth stretched across its face when it opened its mouth. It opened much wider than any human could. It didn't look at me as it walked out of the room, and I just stared at it as it walked down the stairs and right through the locked front door. I didn't sleep much after that, and in the morning, I decided not to tell my family about it, since they did not see or hear the creature, and I did not want them to think I was insane. I wish I could say that that was the end of it, but this was not the last time that I saw that creature. Later that summer, we were back in our apartment. Now, our apartment looks over a street with six lanes, so there's almost always at least one car on that stretch of road, even late at night. So, the night this took place, it was around 11 o'clock, and I was the only one in our living room. I was going to go to bed when I noticed something unusual outside my window. The street outside was completely empty, not even a parked car, but what I did see still makes me shudder whenever I think about it. The creature from the cabin was slowly walking down the road. At first, it just walked down the road, then it stopped. Slowly, and to my horror, it turned its head up to make eye contact with me. Our apartment building has many levels, and it was at least 60 feet from our building. It met my eyes exactly. This lasted for about five seconds. Then, it looked away, and I ran to my bed as fast as I could. To this day, I still do not know what I saw those two nights. And if anyone has any idea what I saw, please let me know. I haven't seen this creature since, and I hope I never see anything like that again. I'd like to start off by saying, my parents live on a plantation in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. I won't say specifically where due to privacy. Growing up, it was me and my brother, who is four years older than I, and he's still my best friend to this day. My dad was a farmer, so me and my brother both grew up with a love for the outdoors and adventure. We have over 7,000 acres and a total of six barns. My grandparents owned this land before my father inherited it. They owned slaves and my grandfather treated them all well and even built a small community for them behind our barns so they would be close by in case they were needed. It's the 21st century, so we had no slaves. We had upgraded to farmhands by this point when I was a kid. I was six years old at the time of this encounter, and my brother was 10. My mother had just passed away, and it was just us three left. We were out one day, exploring the barn. My dad was out in the fields, tilling to prepare the crops we had coming in. We ended up down in the community, which was about two miles or so from our house, which consisted of seven houses that were out in the woods. By this time, they were overgrown and underkept due to their lack of tenants who were in charge of upkeep. To give you a bit of insight into how these looked, I will try my best to give you a brief explanation. There were all wooden houses, one story of course with a small porch and a large wooden door. They had two windows on each side of the front door and windows all along the sides, all broken. The grass was waist high and the tree limbs had broken into the windows and some had even grown into the sides of one house. My brother was carrying a machete to chop away some of the undergrowth so we could get to them. We entered the front house that was a bit bigger than the rest with tin on the roof and a brick chimney. The steps broke under our feet and my brother had to help me climb up. The porch had almost completely rotted by this point. I'm not a tall girl and my legs are especially short, making high cabinets and big steps difficult for me, even now. My brother went first, opening the door with a heavy kick from the wood being warped and disfigured. He shut the door best he could behind us. We entered the house to see most of the floor was missing, revealing grass and even small trees growing through the floor. Rodents scattered in every direction, making me yelp, but my brother just laughed. 
There is a mattress to the left. That springs were the only thing remaining. All of a sudden, we heard a loud crack right outside the door, causing both of us to freeze where we were. My brother whispered that it was probably a deer and to be super quiet so we could see him. We both slowly crept over to one of the windows to try to see outside and catch the deer. We both had a love for animals and enjoyed watching them. As we reached the window, we heard a very hushed voice and I very distinctly remember the deep growl of one of the voices telling the other, Shut up. I don't know where they went, but I swear to God when we find them, we'll kill all of them. I don't care. I'll kill them before I go to jail. Then he erupted into maniacal laughter that echoed through the woods. I remember the look on my brother's face. I knew he was terrified. My brother was only 10 at the time, but he was almost six feet and almost nothing scared him. If he was scared, I knew I should be. He whispered for me to crouch down so he couldn't be seen through the window. I crept down next to a rotten couch that reeked of decay. The smell alone made me gag. Tears were spilling out of my eyes and I kept my hands over my mouth to keep my sobs quiet. I bit down so hard on my hand, I remember tasting blood. My brother was peering over the side of the window, his face white. I heard limbs breaking as the trespassers were making their way towards every house to find us. I remember thanking God that my brother had shut the door. He motioned me to come towards him, and I slowly crept to where he was, trying to make as little as noise as possible. He told me he was going to open the door, and when he did, then I needed to run all the way back to the house and try to find Dad. He kept nudging me towards the door and was getting frustrated when I wouldn't move. I heard one of the men tell the other one to check the big building, and my heart froze. The house we were in was significantly bigger than the others, and I knew they were coming for us. We heard sticks snapping from every direction, and in my child's mind, I knew we were going to die. Nothing is scarier than thinking you're going to die at such a young age. I was absolutely terrified. I was behind my brother against the wall and he was holding my hand. I remember how sweaty his shaking hand was and how fast his heart was beating. He had the machete brandished like some sword in a sci-fi movie and I almost chuckled at the sight. As scared as I was, the door to the house was kicked open and there stood four men standing about six feet or so in height. They all looked like they hadn't bathed in years and I could smell them from where they were standing. They smelt of rotten meat and body odor. Their teeth were yellowing, some missing, and they looked like they had been beat up, covered in bruises and blood. The blonde guy in the front was the first to speak. His voice still terrorizes me to this day. Well, look at what we have here. A knight in shining armor and what a damn princess. He had laughed. My brother spoke in the deepest voice he could manage. Th this is my d dad's land. You better get out. He's got guns and he'll shoot you. The blonde guy chuckled, shaking his head and took a step towards us. The next thing he said chilled me to my core. Your daddy can't save you. No one can. I'm your god now. He said as he took another step towards us. He looked over at me and my blood went cold. He smiled and I could see he only had one front tooth and only a few were left in his menacing smile. I love pretty blonde girls. I'd love to take you with me, my own pretty little girl. I've always wanted one. I cried out and buried my face into my brother's back as I wept, screaming for my dad. Daddy can't save you now, he screamed, and my brother lunged toward the guy and swung the machete as hard as he could, almost knocking himself over from its weight. All three of the guys started laughing maniacally. My brother stepped closer to the men swinging the machete again, coming inches from the blonde guy's face. He leaned back to avoid the blow and started only laughing louder. The sound was like something out of the most awful horror movie. I could hear the crackling in their voices. Their smiles made it all the more worse. All three of the men were in the house with us now and the lanky black-haired guy shut the door behind him. 
they kept inching closer to us, and my brother was telling me to stay behind him as he kept the machete pointed towards them. Then, the most heavenly sound. Out of nowhere, we heard a truck horn, and my heart jumped into my throat. The road leading to the community was maybe 200 yards from the house, with few trees between it. The guys went stock straight and bolted out the door. One of their legs fell through the floor, but he quickly yanked it out and bolted. We looked out to see my dad and cousins jumping out of his truck with all their guns in hand. They fired a few shots, missing the men by only inches. My dad ran into the house and scooped me up. My brother was crying, and my dad was too. He hugged me and my brother so tight that day. My dad never let us go near the community again and only let us go into the barns if he was with us. He told me recently he thought he were dead already and he will never be happier than the day he found us alive. As for the guys, after my dad and cousins arrived, they bolted deeper into the woods and my cousins pursued them but gave up after a mile or so. My cousin still swears he shot one of them in the leg but it was never confirmed. My dad told my brother he was coming to the barn for a drink and to the rest for a minute and heard my screams and they immediately followed them to us. My brother and I both received intense counseling for the next few months afterwards. I'm 22 years old now and I still wake up in a panic, reliving the worst day of my life with those awful men. I am so thankful for my brother for doing his best to keep me alive. I'm even more thankful for my dad and cousins and that they had given the fields a rest even if just for a moment. God only knows what would have happened to us had they not shown up. It scares me to this day to think about it. About five years ago, me and my older sister went to a nature park, a wetland, so to speak. Of course, we went at night so we could skateboard around because you aren't allowed to. But you know, in front of her 24-year-old sister, well, we just went around as the sun was setting. For a little bit, we got lost since the park was so huge and condensed with the thick woods. We were trying to find the bridge, a 20 foot or so bridge so we can hang out just above the rushing river. By the time we got there, the sun was hardly visible over the mountains. I looked around after drinking my water, and here is where the creepy stuff happened. As I looked at the other side of the bridge, I saw a tall skinny figure. I first shrugged it off like it was a person, maybe a ranger of the park, but then it got on all fours and walked away. I didn't say anything at first, mainly because I thought it was maybe a bear. I looked back at my sister as we chatted about boys and along many other things. Then I looked back at the end of the bridge. My sister did too, and we both saw the figure this time. At this point, I was totally freaked out. Mind you, it's still not dark out. The sky was purple and orange, so it wasn't like we were seeing things that when your mind pictures figures in the dark. No, it was right there getting closer. I told my sister to get the hell out of there. Her going first off the bridge and down the hill. I went second, and as I turned to look at the bridge again, it was five feet in front of me on all fours once again. It stood there as me and my sister skated off and this isn't even the end. I told my sister to head to the main building since there's cameras and lots of lights. We skateboarded for what seemed like hours. Every minute seemed to last an eternity. As we finally get to the main building, we finally stopped riding our boards. Out of breath and scared, we both looked around and by this time, it was pitch black outside. We made a mad dash to the car, taking a path we have never seen before, but it was outside the park, which made us feel safer. After we got to my sister's Jeep, we both got in, hearts racing and scared out of our minds, and when we tried to leave the gate, it was locked, meaning we couldn't leave since there was only one way in and out of the park. We got even more scared. We tried everything to get out. We even thought about just leaving the car behind and walking the two hours home. But we drove onto the sidewalk and got out of the park. 
to this day, I won't ever go back into those wetlands ever again, even in daylight. Whatever that thing was, I never want to see it again. I can't stop thinking about it, and I'm almost 19. You can think this is just a story, but it really did happen. Me and my sister don't even talk about it to this day. Something changed between us. I could feel it after that very day. When I was little, I used to see shadow people. I used to sleep in my mom's bedroom as a child and obviously I went to bed before the rest of my family because I was so young. On one particular night, my parents tucked me in a bed and left a light on for me and left the door open so that I wouldn't get scared. When they left, I saw what looked like a bunch of human shadows by the TV. I looked at them for a little while and they seemed to be moving, like they were walking on a city street. Being six years old, I got scared and hid under my covers and quickly went to sleep after that. I don't remember seeing them again in my mom's bedroom, but I do remember seeing them just out of the corner of my eye. I told my parents and they just thought it was just my imagination or my mind playing tricks on me. I'm still adamant to this day that I saw shadow people and even individuals who would stay in my room for a little while as if they were watching me and then leave. I don't see them anymore and I don't know if I'll ever see them again. August 24th, 2019. It's been almost three weeks since my father received his cancer diagnosis. It's a bright sunny Saturday morning and there's plenty to do around the house. So I put my earbuds on, selected a playlist from my iPhone, picked up the weed trimmer and walked to the far corner of our third acre lot. It's your typical new suburban home in Central Florida. Lightly painted stucco walls with two to three understory trees and St. Augustine grass lawn. The mission for the day is to clear about two feet off the property line of any St. Augustine grass to continue planting hedges. I'm trimming away when all of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I see a black spot, almost like a black sheet that someone has hung to dry off the side of the house. The flickering black is so deep that you can almost see green, purple, blue hues. As quickly as it came, it disappeared. This happened multiple times all throughout the morning. In total, I must have seen this spot four to five times. What has started out as a larger black flickering sheet would turn out more refined every time I saw it, always out of the corner of my eye. Last I saw it for the day, it would have been around noon and by then, a more slender, human-like figure was present from the shoulders up, with sort of a foggy, undefined bottom. Not being a big believer and almost an atheist, I convinced myself that it was stress or too much brightness outside and went on about my day as if nothing had happened. August 25th, 2019. I visit my parents' house. They live about five miles down the road from us. They had moved into their new home only a couple of months prior spent most of the day just hanging out. I'm driving back home, thinking of all the things I must do at work Monday morning. I'm driving, but I'm a bit unfocused, kind of daydreaming, numb from all the things our family is going through and worried how the next couple of months will turn out with my dad's disease. Come to the one and only stop sign between our places. Brake, look left, look right, hit the gas. Out of thin air, a shadow appears right in front of the car. I didn't quite see it fully. The reflex was to immediately hit the brakes again, mid-intersection. Just as it came, it was gone. This time, I shared with what I saw with my partner, only to receive a call from my mom a few hours later. Dad is not doing well, and he's being rushed to the hospital. August 26, 2019. Dad unexpectedly passes. I said his death was unexpected because... Even with a cancer diagnosis, he was doing quite well. He had just started his treatment, and for the first time since his three-week-old diagnosis, we thought we would have him around for another year or so. What exactly did I see? Why at my house and not at theirs? Granted, my parents had lived with us from December to May while their home was being built. In the midst of all the grief, I started to look for answers as to what I experienced. Seems to be some form of shadow people, I believe they came to warn or to guide him to the afterlife. 
Anyway, just wanted to share my experience and see if anyone else has similar ones. Here is my written account of the four Bigfoot sightings I told you about. I will start by giving you a little background as to the year, area, and season. The year is about 1978, give or take a year or so. The area is between Adele and West Des Moines, Iowa, roughly following the Raccoon River. It is late fall in November. The story starts when a girlfriend of mine told me about a neighbor of hers, a farmer, who said that early on one morning, about 4 a.m., as he was making coffee, he noticed a big creature standing beneath his yard light. He described it as standing about seven feet tall and covered with black hair. He watched it for a while until it walked away. I didn't think much about it until a few days later when I heard on the news that a truck driver on I-80 of the vicinity of the Raccoon River saw, apparently, the same creature in his headlights. I was surprised when I heard this given the story from my girlfriend just a few days prior. As it happened, a few days after that I was talking to a friend of mine from high school about the same sightings, he began telling me too that he had seen the creature, almost he did not report it. He said that one evening during the same time period and in the same area, he went to a small cabin he'd built in the woods near the river. As he approached the structure, a tall creature with black hair jumped up and ran out the door. He assumed it had been sleeping on the floor in a pile of leaves. This building was not completed and there was no roof. It was just turning dark, so he didn't get a good look at it. But because he was so close there, there was no mistaking its size. He described it as about seven feet tall and covered with black hair. It scared him so much that he ran in the opposite direction. What happened next was truly amazing to me. A few days later, my brother who farms with me was driving a tractor home from the fields very late at night. It was around 11.30 p.m. with a full moon and just a dusting of snow on the ground. He stopped in a rural portion of West Des Moines and watched as two Bigfoot creatures walked calmly by the side of the road. They were about 100 yards away and walked parallel to the road beside a fence in an open area that has no trees. One of the creatures was taller, at about seven feet, and the second was about a foot shorter. He said they had long swinging arms, a short neck, black hair from head to toe, and they were not afraid of his presence, although he was some distance away. He reported to me that the next day he went back for another look, and to his surprise, discovered that the area where these creatures had been was covered with dense, short, prickly underbrush. There is no way a human could walk so freely in that area. It's just not possible. But there is more. The next right or so, as I was working in our farm, shop, late into the evening, I heard a sound that I'll never forget. I can best describe it as a long, loud, mournful cry or wail. I suppose it lasted five to ten seconds, and I heard it twice. It was not a dog, coyote, fox, or owl. I know the sounds of these animals, and I've never heard a large cat wail before, but it was a bit until like that, I suppose. When I first heard it, I immediately noticed that our two dogs took off running for the barn. That I had never seen before. Usually animal sounds are returned with loud barking. We live about three miles north of where my brother saw both creatures, and my mother heard it too. Hello. I'm a 21-year-old guy from Denmark, and back in 2017, I was going for a vacation road trip in the United States. We started off in Las Vegas, where my mom visited an old woman she lived with for a year, back when she was 16, an exchange student. We then drove to LA, and then to Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and finally, Louisiana. I am, and I was very into true scary stories. I especially enjoy cryptid, unexplained creatures, and skinwalker wendigo stories. And I told my family about it, but my sister and her boyfriend teased me about believing in such things. My dad doesn't believe in God or superstitious or anything, but have had some strange things happen to him. So he is a little more open-minded, which my mom also, because she has had some experience some paranormal things. 
when we were driving through the deserts of Arizona. My dad had to have a smoke and we wanted to stretch our legs. We got out of the car and my dad started smoking and we looked around. Then suddenly, my sister says, what is that? And pointed towards the desert where we immediately noticed a lion-sized, totally black cat. Like it was so black that it absorbed all the light. It was just walking. It had a really long and thick tail and it walked so weird like it was a robot, just totally stiff legs. Then it noticed us and just froze and turned its head really fast and just stared. Then it turned its whole body without moving its head and started walking in our direction. Then I said that we should probably get in the car and get moving because I wasn't staying around and waiting for it to reach us. My family quickly agreed and we hurried to get in the car and take off. For the rest of the trip, my sister's boyfriend and my sister didn't tease me about my unexplainable creatures anymore. We were really agitated by this thing. I started to Google and search about animals that live in Arizona and I couldn't find anything about a big feline that was black anywhere in the world. The only big cats I could find were jaguars and it's rare they get black and not that black. It was also much larger than jaguar. And jaguars, cougars, or mountain lions live in forested areas, definitely not in the middle of dirt or cacti. I still think about this a lot and I've never found an answer to what this were. And I believe even more now that there are creatures in this world that we know nothing about. So, I've been listening to scary stories and cryptid encounters for years now, and my family has never really believed me, because I myself am a big believer in them, even though I've never had any personal accounts, thank you God. But just recently, my good mate's brother told me about that he ran into one of these dog werewolf things, whatever the hell they are, when he went hunting back in the fall. He told me that he must have got to this buck first before this dogman did, because, coincidentally, he thinks both him and the same creature were hunting the same buck. He claimed that it was pissed off and showed itself after he killed it, and even tried to go as far as attack him with the intent to kill. He let it take his kill and said he didn't want any part to play in fending that creature off. When I picked his brain about it for proof that he wasn't lying, he got really emotional and started freaking out and his whole tone of voice changed. There's just a certain genuine and sincerity in somebody's tone when they're recalling a past traumatic experience that you can tell they're not lying. When he described it, he said it was hairy and had a longer snout and it resembled the werewolves from the Underworld movies is what he told me. Then he says it couldn't have been that though because he knows that werewolves are fictional creatures and don't exist in the real world. So, what is it that he ran into? I think he ended his speculation with it with some sort of mutated or damaged or deranged wolf or possibly mange or even a hybrid. He doesn't know. The following story you are about to hear is 100% true. Parts of the story might sound like it's from a movie, but I assure you, it all happened on the way it was to this day and it's still a mystery of what actually happened. It was the last few minutes of class before school ended for spring break. As me and my best friend Josh were waiting for the bus to pull up to take us home, we started to talk about what we wanted to do for spring break. We talked all the way from home, playing basketball, working out, to even building our own go-karts out of scraps that his grandfather had in his old beat-down shed out back. When we finally arrived at our destination, Getting ready to step off the bus, our other friend Kimberly stopped us and asked us if we could all meet up a little later that night. See, we all lived in the same area, so we decided to meet up around 11 o'clock so our parents would think we were in bed. Later that night, before we snuck out of our houses, we called Kimberly and asked where she wanted to meet at. We all decided to meet up at a little crossroads section about four miles out from where we lived. The only problem is it's all single gravel road surrounded by thick woods that stretches about 15 miles to the nearest highway. So naturally, 
We were a little scared to begin with to walk by ourselves in the dead of the night in the middle of nowhere. On the way there, me and my friend Josh were talking about the old haunted slave shack that still resigned since the 1800s, about a mile to the left of where we were meeting at. As we pressed forward, my friend and I started feeling like we were being watched from a distance. Shrugging it off, we continued down the old creepy road, still talking about the slave shack. We noticed a shooting star that zoomed by the night sky. This is where the night would haunt us forever. We continued down the gravel road, still talking, when all of a sudden, we see two more shooting stars, then another, and another, until it looked like a machine gun was shooting stars from it. We were amazed by what we had just seen, but we finally reached our destination, seeing Kimberly sitting on the patch of grass on the side of the road. We all hugged and just sat there, talking about what we were going to do during spring break. Hours have passed, and it's now 3 a.m. in the morning, still sitting and still talking. Then out of nowhere, this unusually large dog approached us. It was a very sweet, loving, kind dog, not usual for a stray. I decided to get up and stretch my legs while Kimberly and Josh were still petting the dog. Out of the corner of my eye, I seen this dog in the distance sitting in a very propped up way as dogs do when they sit. But as I looked and stared at this dog, all I could see was the black shape of a silhouette. All of a sudden, I felt this eerie feeling come upon me as if something was going to happen. I noticed the ears on the strange dog were so sharp, it looked like if you were to poke it, it would draw blood. A chilling gust of wind blew all around us as this happened and I heard screams coming from behind me. I ran over to Kimberly and Josh and asked what had happened. They said that the dog they were petting just disappeared over the sheer drop off on the other side of the road. Now, let me tell you that anybody or anything that fell off that side would have died, but we see nothing. And as they kept looking, I kept hearing strange noises coming from where I'd seen that creepy dog. I walked to where I was before I ran back over to see what they were screaming about. And sure enough, that creepy dog was still staring at me. And at that moment, I seen the dog's head looked up at them and then back at me. In that moment, a very bright beam of light lit the ground only around us. It was so bright that after the light flashed, I couldn't see anything for about a minute. Kimberly and Josh jumped up as I turned to them and asked, please tell me I wasn't the only one who seen that. We all agreed it was not our imagination and decided to huddle together and try to figure out what just happened. As we stood there contemplating on what we should do, we all started to feel that feeling again as if we were all being watched. Me and Josh started to talk about how we were going to protect Kimberly if anything was to happen. Then, out of nowhere, we turned to Kim to talk to her and noticed she was pale as a ghost standing there, lifeless. I was facing in the other direction from both of them, and then Josh started to get pale. I asked what was wrong with them, and Josh slowly quietly said, Dude, there is something standing about 40 feet behind you. As he told me that, chills ran down my spine through my legs, and I got weak. When I turned slowly around, scared of what I'd see, I was mortified by what I had just seen. Standing there in the bush, about 40 feet away from me was a tall black figure, at least eight feet tall, and was walking towards us with a limp like movement. The complete panic and fear blazed through our bodies. I turned to both of them and said, start walking home now and don't look back. We started our four mile long frightening journey back home. Along the way there, I kept telling Josh to stay behind Kimberly and calm her down from crying with a panic. I was behind Josh because I wanted to make sure they both were in front of me so that if anything were to happen, they could get away and get help. As we were almost home, we continued to power walk through the thick woods down the gravel road and I started to feel that feeling again as if someone or something was behind me. I didn't dare look back, afraid of what I might see, but continued anyway only to hear gravel being swept away as if somebody was running at us from behind, chasing us. 
I told them to start running as fast as possible since we could see Josh's house in the distance. Finally, we were able to get off the gravel road and make it up the hill to his window. We quickly opened it, climbed in, relieved that this whatever it was was over. All that night, none of us slept, a single minute still wondering and frightened over what happened. We decided to let Kim sleep in the closet of his bedroom till morning and then would walk her home. Weeks went by as it was time for school again, keeping our story a secret. We told no one of our encounter, fearing what people would think. During lunch, we agreed to start telling people what happened. And to our surprise, some people said they had experiences at the small crossroads section also. Some people say it was some sort of alien encounter. Some say it was the Grim Reaper searching for the old slave that haunted the shack nearby and would take anybody it could get. To this day, 14 years ago, we still have no answers on what or who was with us that frightening spring night. But it has haunted us to this day and we will never forget our encounter with the supernatural. Was it an alien or could it have been the Grim Reaper as some people suggest? I guess I'll never know. Maybe one day I'll find out, but then again, I guess I don't want to go back to that awful place ever again. This story takes place in the deserts of Arizona. Me and my dad are on a camping trip with the rest of our family, but thanks to the size of the family, we had to take two cars. One car is for one boys and one for girls. I had three sisters, but thanks to the size of the family, we had to take two cars. One car, one for boys and one for girls. I had three sisters, but I was the only boy. Three hours later, a nightfall approaches making it harder to drive with only one headlight working. So my dad decides we should stop and camp there for the night. I said I was down as long as we sleep in the car, not really camping, but if you had to choose between a car seat and the ground, then we'll talk. Anyway, he agreed, so we drove off the road and onto the sand with cactus as far as the eye could see. Both began our descent into slumber. Only I couldn't, as I was a bit of an insomniac, which I was fine with. It just meant I could look up at the night sky. But then I heard the blood-curdling screech of some kind of humanoid being howling at the vast emptiness of the desert. At first, I thought it was a coyote, but coyotes don't sound like that at all. Frozen solid, I look out the window to see a tall, lanky creature standing on all fours of its extremely long, unnatural appendages. At first glance, I would have just blended in with the cacti surrounding the area with its seemingly prickly skin, but I didn't just peek and look away. I was flat out staring at it until my eyes locked with its two small white dots was all I could see. I'm shitting bricks at this point, but bricks turn to boulders as it full on charges out of the small car, which could easily be flipped with little effort. I guess that all the commotion woke up my dad because before I knew it, we're driving off the sandbank into the road, flooring it the whole way only to get the back window smashed in with the creature slamming its two finger hand in the glass screen, sending shards everywhere, even into its own hand. It didn't follow us for much longer as it had glass shrapnel in its hand and it started to slow down and limp away, leaving blood marks on the back door. We kept driving without looking back, fearing to see it again. Eventually we had to stop as we caught up with the rest of the family and we all shared the same expressions on our faces, the look of terror glued on. That is one day I will never forget. Me and five friends were walking in the woods at night on April 2nd this year, and we saw something pretty big and real thick and furry crouching behind a bush that was in between two trees. He had his hands on the tree and poked up to look at us. We had a video camera with us at the time, but it does not show the creature. The reason we had the camera with us was because the, all the dogs in our town were going crazy the last few days, and we had heard odd noises coming from down in those woods, which were right alongside the Des Moines River. We got extremely scared at the sight of this thing and took off running right after we flipped the camera light on to try to get it on tape. 
The next morning, we went down to the same spot to try and find some evidence. We found nothing really important there, except some broken twigs and whatnot. However, a little ways away, we found a large femur bone, either from a cow or a human. It was much too big to be a deer, and wasn't a horse. This led us to dig around, and we found 22 more bones. We also noticed a bunch of fur around the area, like rabbit or something. About a week later, we went back during the day, because we were scared of at night, and found a deer dead with its rear bit completely off, shredded. I guess I don't remember exactly when I started seeing a tall, skinny black figure, but it has been happening on and off for years now. I didn't know it was abnormal. I went to a meditation retreat two years ago, and on the fourth day, I was terrified to close my eyes because whenever I did, multiple black figures with yellow glowing eyes would propel themselves towards me, and I would open my eyes right before they reached my face. I couldn't sleep at night because I was terrified they would come, and they did when the lights were off, even with my eyes open. During the meditation sessions, I would just sit there with my eyes open and silently cry, safely in a room full of 80 other people. I was scared for my life within my own mind, but also transferring to the physical. I was scared, confused, and terrified. I requested to talk to the leader or whatever because we could ask questions for five minutes. I told him about it, and he said that all I needed to do was to keep my eyes shut while they came at me and let it happen. Face them, let them take over, and accept them. I went back and did that, and I had to force myself to squeeze my eyes tight and to not open them. It was absolutely terrifying, but they did not come back for the rest of the retreat, and I was able to sleep and meditate. I started seeing a tall figure again this winter. It appears out of the corner of my eye, and when I look, it slides away. When it happens during the day, I am scared but feel safer. But when it happens at night, I'm terrified. I either sit as still as I can or hold my breath and run to my room. The place I live has a lot of sharp corners going into different rooms, so that makes it way worse than even running away. When I was a teenager, I used to go fishing with my dad all the time, and we had several great fishing spots around where we lived that we would frequent during the spring and summertime. My dad took me fishing from when I was just a young boy. It was our favorite pastime, and we still continue to do it to this day. But there were times here and there that due to my dad's work schedule, I just had to fly solo for a day of fishing, which I always enjoyed the peace and quiet anyway. My dad still doesn't know about this to this day because I am and always was afraid he wouldn't believe me, so I've refrained from saying anything, but I have told a few friends here and there as I've gotten older, and they have no idea what it is, and surprisingly, believe me. I went to one of our good fishing spots on a day in spring when my dad had to work late, and so I thought I would get an early start and get out there and hopefully catch some fish. Usually, my dad and I were fairly lucky when it came to catching, but this morning, the fish biting and game was dead. I probably sat there for a good seven hours waiting for a bite, only to get nothing. It's very unusual for no fish or signs of life to be in the water like there was, so I thought that was weird. These ponds are usually always full of life. Frogs, tadpoles, small fish, even flies, mosquitoes, nothing. There was usually no shortage of life, and now it was dead. Like I said, this day was unusually quiet, but I didn't think anything of it at the time. I was just a boy. Off to the right, I started to hear some movement in the water, like a large fish coming up to the surface, and I got really excited, hoping this would be my one chance to catch something really big and impress my dad. To my surprise, well, more to just my surprise, out of the water came the most ugliest, creepiest, amphibian-looking thing I've ever seen. Upon first glance, it actually reminded me of that old 1950s black and white horror movie. I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head. Oh wait, Creature of the Black Lagoon, I think. 
I'm not too sure, but many of you listening to this will know exactly what I'm talking about. It was humanoid looking, but it was also scaly and green and slimy and was kind of a vibrant green. It burst right out of the water, walking up onto the shoreline, opposite of where I was. Its back was to me, so it never turned or saw me or looked at me. So I think, and it walked off right into the forest nonchalantly. It burst out of the water and just walked up to the shoreline and off in the woods so quickly that I didn't even breathe for a good 30 seconds. I was frozen, not even sure how to comprehend what I had just witnessed. After regaining somewhat of a grip on reality, I realized I totally pissed my pants and I fled back to my house in total fear. I didn't really go fishing with my dad after that for about a good month and just told him I wasn't feeling well whenever he wanted to go with me. After a while, we ended up going back and even back to that same spot. I made the exception with my father because he made me feel safe and I never saw or encountered anything like that ever again, even now when I fish. I really have no explanation for what I saw, but to give a little more detail, it was tall and slender, taller than my father and he's around 6'2". It was what I would call slime green and had long black claws hanging from its hands or what looked to be hands. I can't give you an accurate estimate on how far away it was for me, but far enough away that I could see enough detail to make out what it was. I also wasn't making any sounds, so I'm assuming that's why it never turned around to notice me. Like I said before, the best way I could summarize it is that from behind, it looks like some sort of amphibious humanoid sort of thing. I have no idea why it had long black claws on the end of each of its hands or what it could be used for. It was also a clear, sunny, bright day out, so there was clearly no misidentification on what I saw. I got a clear as day view for a good 5 to 10 seconds, and there's no mistaking it. As much as it scared the hell out of me, I did not let it stop me from enjoying my love of fishing, which I still love to do to this day. Again, I've not had any experiences with anything like this since, and hope I don't. For the meanwhile, I'm going to just keep loving fishing. Around 7 a.m., let's say the first week of November of 2007, I was making a phone call to try and get some help on a very large roof that I was working on. Standing to the right of the house, facing the back, is a large, open, grassy field surrounded by woods. I was looking to the back, staring at this particular tree that stood out to me, when suddenly, something very tall, very large, stepped away from the tree looking at me. My arm with the phone dropped, and my jaw dropped, and I was thinking to myself, what the hell is that? Its fur was brown to reddish brown, and it covered the entire body that I could see from the waist up. Just as quickly as I had seen it, it made its way across the field in a matter of seconds. I was on the phone, but I took note of where I was standing, and that was around me. Next to me were a couple of snowmobiles, and about five feet in front of me, was a red quad and was on the far right corner of concrete pad. The grass was very high because the day before I had noticed a couple of deer walking through the field and all I could see was their back, neck and heads. The next day my brother-in-law came out and we walked back where I saw this thing. When I looked back towards the house I couldn't see the red quad or snowmobiles at all. I saw no clear footprints out there. There were lots of trails to the grass that could have been made by anything. When this thing ran across the field, it was slightly leaning forward. It had to have been at least 7 or 8 feet tall in order for me to see its entire upper body over the grass. The next day when I showed up, I couldn't get in the house because the alarm had been triggered. I called the homeowner and he said that something triggered in the basement door alarm and the basement window alarm that same night. He had to leave in a hurry and forgot to reset the alarm. I thought that was very interesting, but I did not tell him what I had seen the morning before. A few years ago, in the fall, I had one of those dogmen sons of bitches steal a buck from right outside the back of my truck. Long story short, because I'm not going to feed you a seven page encounter story 
so I'll keep it really brief. Long story short, I got me a four-pointer, tagged it, and stuck him in the back of my truck. This was a good-sized buck too, and I was going to bring it to my friend who's a taxidermist because I wanted to keep the hide intact. But I guess that son of a bitch made sure that wasn't going to happen. I'm about 50 feet away from my truck, dealing with my tarps and getting them ready to cover my kill. As I hear my truck sitting down and what sounds like a boulder being thrown onto it, and I turn around and this dog looking person, a dog man, reaches down from jumping up in the truck, grabs onto the buck with one hand, pulls it up and throws it over its shoulder in one fluid motion, all while turning and jumping into the trees with my kill. I can hardly believe what I just saw, so much so that my mouth was practically on the ground in sheer disbelief. This thing has never looked over at me, and it just grabbed its prize, or well, my prize that it stole, and bolted into the woods. Of course, I screamed and hollered, but by the time I went to go get my gun out of the cab of my truck, it was long gone. This thing was fast, and I wasn't even afraid of the sheer size and speed of this thing, just pissed the fact that it took all my effort away. It was in the fall of 2006. We were camping in the Volga River Recreational Area in Fayette, Iowa. It was myself and five other friends. We were sitting around the campfire. I'm going to have to say it was around 11.30 p.m. There was a campsite farther down from us with a husband and a wife. They also were sitting by the fire. My friends and I decided to take a walk about the campsite. There is an open field along the road and the campsite. Josh and I decided to sit there to see if we could call in some coyotes that night because the moon was full that night making it easy to see. The rest of the guys went back to the campsite. Josh and I went and sat along the side of the field. We were sitting there, making the sound of a dying rabbit. The field is border with large trees and bushes. After about five to ten minutes, we see a large person step out onto a little hill at the edge of the trees off to our left. We had a tall friend with us, so started saying to the person, ha <laughs> ha, Mike, very funny. Gestures of that sort, and that person didn't move nor speak. All we could see was its upper torso and its eye color, and I can't recall the exact color. So we ran back to the campsite to make sure it wasn't just our friends spooking us. And sure enough, they were all there. Josh and I grabbed a shotgun that I had brung for safety, and when we got back to the spot, the person was gone. We were both very frightened by this and we ran back to the campsite, told everyone what we had heard, but nobody believed us. Later that night, I saw it again. This time it was in the woods, across from our campsite, just on the edge of the woods. The moonlight was bright, and this time I called everyone to come look over. And this time, Mike, Josh, and me all saw a very large black shadow across the road, moving towards the first spot we had just seen it. After the incident, I really had no idea what this was. It was very large, like a man, probably about eight feet tall, and I could tell it had its back to us, and it was black in color. I also saw eyes, and that is all I can recall from the incident. Hearts were definitely racing at the time. In the early 2000s, I was practicing to be a diving instructor, or at least that's the direction I was headed. That is, until I had this strange experience that scared me so bad, it made me not want to be in the ocean anymore. You might hear this and think I'm totally overreacting, but the sheer mystery of the ocean is just on a whole other level. I was practicing at the time, down off the coast of Florida, where I would regularly dive at the time with other experienced divers and friends alike. I don't know how much of you know about diving, but there is such a thing that exists called decompression stops in which you have to slowly allow your body to readjust to the levels around you. Otherwise, your body will have too much nitrogen and the buildup can cause bubbles to form inside your body, causing severe tissue and nerve damage, even death if you ascend too quickly, which was ruled as what had killed my buddy, but we'll get to that. Anyway, I wasn't really doing anything official as far as training goes. 
I had a couple of buddies that did this professionally, so I would just recreationally go out with them and have them show me the ropes so that way I had some sort of edge when I went to apply to do it professionally, since I'll have already had all the experience. This particular day, we went quite far out and we were diving a little deeper than usual off a small oceanic cliff area. What I mean by that is the bottom below us was probably 30 to 50 feet and then there was just an ocean drop off where the ocean drop off goes off into the open sea. And this drop off, well, you couldn't see the bottom. It was just pure open ocean. Being in warm tropical waters, so we already knew about the dangers like barracuda, man war and sharks and whatever else is out there, but I'll never understand what I saw. Diving for me is sort of a thrill. Well, not sort of, it is. At least at that time. Part of the enjoyment was not only being in an environment that I wasn't necessarily used to being in, but it was seeing all the amazing sights and animals around me. Even though there were dangerous animals that could potentially kill me, I still enjoyed it. During this rendezvous, I was with a friend of mine who was a professional, and he was showing me some really cool reefs that were down in there. Our boat, which was anchored, probably about 100 feet away from us, sitting idle as we enjoyed and explored every little ounce of the ocean floor reef before us. Because we were in southern Florida, the waters were a little more clear, and looking up at the boat was still perfect in sight. As we made our way, we approached the large cliff I was talking about, and even thought that it dropped out into the open ocean. Swimming out into the open ocean, you can see a small cavern opening down just a little bit. Even though it was murky, it was still fairly visible. My friend, being the more experienced diver of course, he was all about that, and exploring, and the thrill of adventure, and told me to hold on. He was going to go see if he could explore. The cavern opening was more than large enough for him to fit through. He swam down, pulled out his flashlight with him, even though it was getting darker where he was swimming. This entrance was probably another 50 feet down, just barely enough light to see the entrance. I sat there, eagerly watching him enter the small cavern entrance, and his light disappeared as he entered. I want you to understand that where he was in correlation to the surface was probably now 100 plus feet. I'm sitting there watching the entrance and also keeping an eye around me and my surroundings, trying to keep close to the reef so that way I'm not caught off guard by any sort of oceanic predators. There's plenty of light outside so I wasn't really concerned and I knew most of the predators around here were nocturnal. A few moments later, well probably about 10 or so minutes actually, I see my friend flying out of that cavern up towards the direction of the boat and away from me as I'm trying to throw my arms up and get his attention, but he is going so fast like he's on a mission. Confused and wondering why he's not stopping to do any decompression stops, movement catches my eye from the cavern opening. To my horror, this large gelatin-like blob thing with what looked to be long tentacle-like appendages emerges slowly out of the cavern and starts hovering or blobbing, making its way towards me. I don't know how to call it. It reminded me of an octopus crossed with a jellyfish or something. It was bizarre, but it looked like it had stingers on its appendages or tentacles, and they were long and moved with it. I moved as fast as I could back to the boat with my friend, almost there. Since I was around 30 or so feet from the surface, I didn't have to worry about doing any decompression stops. I turned and I see this blob thing floating up faster and faster towards me, getting closer, extending its tentacles out. I finally get back to the boat with this thing still in the distance and I'm able to climb up and greet my friend who had already climbed up in the boat and was vomiting profusely. After catching my breath for a few moments, I try to get out of him what the hell just happened when he tells me he went down into that cavern and it had a small drop off point where you could swim deeper straight down. And that's where he went for quite a ways when he swam into what he can only describe as an unknown creature that nearly devoured him. He said if he would have swam further, it would have opened up into its mouth and sucked him right in, kind of like some of those big catfish. He didn't look right though. He looked pale and very sick and said one of its tentacles grabbed onto its thigh and ripped open his wetsuit, 
where he had these strange holes in his leg that was bleeding and almost had a pus-like consistency oozing out. He knew that he had not done his decompression stops and he might die due to the severe nitrogen in his body and said he had made a huge mistake by fleeing so quickly. I asked him if he knew what it was, but I didn't tell him that I saw it climb out of the cavern out to us and said he had no idea. I think he was so caught up in his nausea and feeling sick. He told me he initially thought it just dropped off into an empty rock cavern, but this thing must have been living in there. On the way back to the shore, he began having a seizure and died right there on the spot once we arrived. I believed his death was noted as decompression sickness, but I don't know for sure. I've never seen a wound like what was on his leg, and even though he wasn't bleeding out into the water, what I saw, his leg didn't look to be in great shape. Whatever that thing was, blobbing itself through the water towards us, freaked him the hell out, and me. That was the last time I ever really went diving, and have had no desire to explore the unexplored. Was it that thing that killed him, or did he really die of decompression sickness? I'll never know. When we got back to shore, and the EMTs weren't able to save him or try to revive him, I'm not really sure what to make of the whole thing, but I try to keep his memory alive and still do things fun and exciting and adventurous on land to honor my best friend. It was a traumatic experience for me, but I feel like enough time has passed now to where I could safely and calmly talk about it and honor my friend. I took my son Miles fishing behind Sundown Mountain Ski Resort. We turned west off of Asbury Road onto Twin Springs Drive, where there is access to the stream. I had been promising my son some night fishing. We sat on a couple of buckets facing south to the rock outcropping and wooded area across the creek. We were fishing in the deeper water across the creek near the rocks. We heard sticks breaking and rustling, which I assumed were coons, as this is a good coon area. Then we noticed something larger coming toward the other side of the creek from a distance. Thinking that this was one of the many deer that we often see, thought nothing of it until we caught sight of it in the back light of the city or moon from the other side of the hill that we were facing. This was a large bipedal animal, very unlikely to be a person. And this time of night without a light, although we were fishing without a light source also, it came up to the top of the rock outcropping direct across from us and stood between two trees. It then squatted down and just sat there watching us. My son was scared and I was intrigued. Within 10 minutes, another came to join the first to his right and stayed just across a ravine. No more than six minutes later, another came from the south, just to the left of the one squatting across from us. As this one got close, it let out a piercing shriek. Nothing like the calls that we had heard on TV shows. This was high pitched and frightening. The other two took notice and began to move toward the shrieking squatch. At this point, we had enough and grabbed our fishing gear and ran back to the truck. My grandfather used to be a commercial fisherman up in Alaska around the 1960s and told me of a tale of a sea beast that him and his crew encountered while they were 100 plus miles out at sea at night. Well, not totally night, because there was still the evening sun out, so it was more dusk, but something had moved underneath the ship. They were on an industrial sized fishing boat, so something really large must have bumped into the boat and their guess was a whale, but moments later, this giant, what my grandfather describes as dragon-like head, emerges from the water on a long neck and stares over at the boat for a second and then submerges back underneath the water and disappears. Him and his crew went into a frenzy and panicked at what they had just saw. When the boat was first rocked from underneath, my grandfather told me that they thought they had hit some sort of rock or possibly a whale or something, and then a few moments later, this large head emerges about 50 to 100 feet away from the boat to stare back at them. He says the head raised up on a long neck that was higher than the deck of the boat because this creature, whatever it was, was looking down at them. 
I should note that my grandfather is a huge horror movie and sci-fi movie buff, and he eats it up, which works out in his favor, because he was really able to relate to me how this creature looked like what he saw. He couldn't tell me an exact horror movie per se, but he did say that some of the more modern day dragon movies seemed to resemble what the sea creature looked like, and always thought that this was a real life living leviathan. When I asked him an estimated size of the head, he said it was easily the size of a small sedan. That's pretty huge for a head. They never got to see the body of what this thing was attached to since only the neck and head emerged out of the water, but he estimated it to be humongous, considering it went underneath the boat and had enough force behind it to seriously knock the fishing boat around. And keep in mind, this is a big fishing boat. We're talking about an industrial fishing boat. Here's a few more details. So, the boat at the time was actually anchored, and like I said earlier, they were probably a hundred or so miles off the coast of Alaska somewhere. When I asked him for even more details of what the skin and face looked like, or if he remembers seeing any eyes, he recalled it as having dark green skin, covered in large scales the size of a human torso, and said it had deep greenish blue eyes. It had a long lizard dragon-like face, and said it was comparable to the Tyrannosaurus Rex from Jurassic Park movies, but also a little more dragon-like if that makes any sense, but couldn't see or make out any of the teeth of this creature since it never opened its mouth. Actually, one thing I wanted to mention is I'm a huge lover of the video game Skyrim, and of course my grandfather has watched me play it before, and he's made comments before about how the dragons look in that game and how similar they look to what he saw that day. Anyway, just a quick side note for you. Anyway, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just simply Google Skyrim Dragons and just know that whatever he saw looked like a mix between that and the T-Rex from Jurassic Park 1 and 2. Anyway, he told me that this creature probably didn't see the boat as any sort of threat and probably bumped into it by accident and stuck its head out of the water to see what it was out of curiosity since he said that's kind of the gist he got from it. He's had other bizarre experiences out at sea, but that one certainly takes the cake with an unknown creature that he's never seen before. The entire crew on the ship was terrified, and it halted a lot of progress for a day or so before progress regained. Something interesting that he told me was that whole day, they were having an awful time catching anything, and were potentially thinking of moving locations because just a few days prior, well, even just a day prior, they were catching their quota in fish, and that was just a bad day for fishing. Then what do you know? Come the evening time and they run into this thing. Makes me wonder that if the fish in the area fled, knowing this giant animal, marine thing, whatever it was, was around, kind of like how deer and other animals will flee an area where they know an alpha predators are around. I don't have any substantial proof for that claim, but it really just makes you think when you think about how animals act in biology and science. Interesting. I need to start with telling you that I am a no bullshit kind of person. I don't like to lie or make stuff up and because of my job, I have to be as honest and credible as possible and maintain somewhat of my integrity. I knew that if I told anybody besides you and maybe a few other people who are open to this, I would probably be mocked and called crazy. So. I figured I would give it a shot by telling you this. You can tell me what you think. You seem to know a lot about it, so maybe you can give me some pointers. I truck for a living, and a couple of months back, I hit and killed an animal that I couldn't identify. I did not stick around long enough to truly get a great look at it because I got the feeling that they were potentially more around the area than I may have pissed them off by killing one of their kind. I want to say I was somewhere between Illinois and Iowa, and I could tell you it was a long stretch of road, flatlands, and I was the only truck on the road at the time. It was early in the morning, and it was pitch black outside. I'm driving, and all of a sudden, this large black dog steps out on the road and looks right in my direction. When I say steps out, he steps out onto the road as close to where I was that I did not even have time to stop the truck at all, and all I could do was honk the horn. He was standing on two legs. 
It was too late for that, though, and I ended up colliding with whatever this two-legged humanoid dog thing was. I heard the thud and had to pull over immediately to see what happened. So I pull over to the side of the road where there is barely any room to begin with and put my hazards on and grab my trusty flashlight. I run back there and lying there on the road is this ugly looking thing. I'll tell you what I ain't ever seen anything that looks like this. This animal was ugly. It reminded me of a dog but looked so human like it was startling. It wasn't too big. I would say maybe 5 feet high if I had to guess when I saw it. My initial reaction was that it was a child or a teenager in a costume, but that just wasn't the case. This thing was maimed up pretty well for my truck, so I did what most people would do and kicked it off the side of the road, not thinking too much of it. When I say this thing was ugly, I really mean that. When it died, part of its lower jaw was broken open exposing all of its sharp, rigid teeth. I remember I gasped at how many teeth that it had, and it was like I was looking into the mouth of a shark, minus the serrated edges on the teeth. It had a shorter snout, but piercing, dull, now lifeless eyes. I sat there and crouched over it, shining my light and scanning over its body to see really what it was and to if I could properly identify what it was I had killed but I could not. Maybe it was a mutated coyote, or possibly a wolf, but all of its sizes and dimensions were just wrong. Then again, it was maimed pretty good from the truck, and that it was a big, bloody mess. I would say the head was the most intact, and was really the only thing I had to go by by trying to figure out what kind of animal this really was. When you and I had spoken about this previously on the phone, you had mentioned to me that it sounded like a dogman to you, or a juvenile dogman at that. See, I know virtually nothing about cryptids, or crypt cryptozoology, or creatures that aren't supposed to exist, I should call them, but I can tell you I've never seen an animal that looked this way. The best way I can relay the feeling to you and your viewers, since I'm sure you will be reading this to them, is that it's kind of like seeing a dead lion for the first time if you've only ever seen house cats. You would be confused, amazed, and terrified at the sight of this massive dead animal, but you could tell by somewhat similar relation in size and shape that it was related to a familiar animal that you kind of knew. I think in the moment, I probably chalked it up to just a mutated coyote, or something, even though it walked out onto the road on two legs. I don't know. I think I was overcome by so much shock about what happened, I didn't really spend too much time with critical thinking. Try not to get my boot covered in blood, and there really wasn't a good way to push it off the road, so I kind of just left it there. I know, I'm an asshole for that, but what am I supposed to do? I got back in my truck and left, and that's pretty much the end of that. To recap, I would say that when it stepped out onto the road, it seemed startled that my truck was there and possibly did not know I was on the road so close when he had stepped out, like it was an accident. I maybe got a second to look at it before it looked right over at me, and then BAM! My truck hit this thing, collided, and I assume killed it on impact would be my best guess. I live in Greensville, Texas, north of town, just off of Highway 69 North. I have lived here for 12 years and have had strange things going on at my house since I moved here. But in the last 2-3 to three years, things have really started happening more. I live down a dirt road off of Highway 69. There are, there are a lot of woods around me. Also, have several neighbors around me too. In late summer of 2017, I was jolted awake in the middle of the night by a loud banging on my house. I knew I wasn't dreaming because I shot straight up, and at that exact moment, my two little dogs flew off my bed, barking and carrying on. I stumbled into the kitchen, wondering what could be happening, and it was 2.38 a.m. My two big dogs outside were not barking, which I thought was odd. To make a long story short, I called the sheriff's department, and two deputies came out, but found nothing. 
From that moment on, every two or three months, I have several incidents for a week or two, and then nothing for another month or two or three. Then, things happen again. This past winter, from November of 2019 to February 2020, I have had several things happen. On three separate occasions while I have been propped in bed watching TV, I have heard a loud growl outside my bedroom, loud enough to hear it over the TV. It was loud and guttural. I have had tapping on the back of my house during the night. It is usually always around the same time of night. In January of 2020, I was once again propped up in bed watching TV, and over my TV, I heard something rubbing on the back of my house on where the wall to my bathroom is. My bedroom and bathroom run together, and my two little dogs jumped off the bed into the bathroom at the back wall barking. I've had rocks thrown at my house. I'm home alone most of the time, but this past Saturday night, April 18th, 2020, my husband just happened to be home. Between 11 and 11.30 p.m., my dog started barking and wouldn't stop so I got her to holler at her to hush. As I got my bedroom door open, my cat was lying in my rocking chair next to my door. I paused to let her out about the time. I heard that same loud guttural growl at my back door. My cat heard it, wheeled around and looked at the back door. I went and woke my husband up. He looked out the back door and saw nothing. I went to the front door and opened it and called my dog. She would not get close to the fence and was barking looking towards the back of the house towards my neighbor's home behind us. All of a sudden, she jumped back, like whatever it was coming towards her. I ran to my guest room to look out the window facing that direction and back towards northwest. I saw something huge and dark in color going across my neighbor's back pasture, moving fast. My neighbor behind me lives alone, and she has had the same things happening at her house. June 28th, 2006. I have early reported a Bigfoot sighting several years ago. This happened to be in Iowa, Decatur County, and so is this occurrence. If you have ever been at least a part-time sportsman and found yourself loving the nature around you, then you may know what I am speaking of. There are creatures and certain sounds that go along with any given area, sounds that birds and other familiar creatures will make. It wasn't until today June 24, 2008, that I put it together. A sound was recognized by myself, which I believe to be a Bigfoot. I will explain as best as I can. I returned to the parcel of land which I had my first visual experience of the creature. He sort of scared me off. I brought a friend with me to shoot some guns as it is a very safe place to do so. We hadn't put too many rounds down range into a steep vertical bank which is probably 50 foot high. We were less than 200 yards from the sighting location, and I could hear two huge rocks being smacked together. It was no coincidence. I have heard this before while in the woods, but only at two locations. It was quite rhythmic, and the number of smacks were like always equaling four to six in the count. I even mentioned too that the man who was with me, but the noise had stopped by the time he heard me over his ear protection. I also had earplugs in, but had no problem hearing the sounds. I kind of think this rock smacking is to let all others of their kind know about humans are around. I'm also thinking that it's to give an all clear message as it is happening, at a specific time, each time. I also think that they use the calls of nature's wildlife to communicate, particularly that of a great horned owl and a crow. This is due to the frequency of time and occurrence which I can't quite explain. It is something you have to experience for yourself. I saw a Bigfoot when my aunt, cousin, and parents were camping at our property. We had a fire blazing and we kept hearing these strange noises, branches breaking, and thumps. After about an hour of this, I was wondering what might be lurking in the woods. So, I went over to the area where I heard the noises to see what it was. I went about 10 yards from the fire, and all of a sudden, something about waist high ran very fast in front of me. To this day, I don't know what it was. I turned and about 9 feet away, I saw an 8 foot creature staring at me. 
I didn't get any facial details. I was too far away from the fire. I could tell that its head had a point on top. It stared at me for about 10 seconds, but I felt like it was 10 minutes. Then it did this slow turn away from me and walked off. I ran back into the cabin and I did not come out for the rest of the night. I did not tell anybody right away because I thought it might have been a trick being played on me, played by my cousins. Six months later, my parents and I found a 15 inch footprint alongside the pond at our property when we were fishing near the area of my sighting. We took pictures of the footprint, and about two years after my sighting, my dad and I were camping out our land, the same area me and my dad heard a knock. The next day, I found a 20 inch footprint. I had a camera with me, and I took pictures of that same footprint. I have no doubt that there is a Sasquatch that has been living around our property, and I think it still might live there.